Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to Air and Planes TV's live coverage of the Festival of Flights, the International Air Show Festival of Flights. And what a wonderful day we have in store for you. Some really good conditions again. I had a spectacular sunset and flying display during the uh, twilight period last night. I'm sure if you're uh, a regular viewer, you'll have been tuned in for that. It was really spectacular with the typhoon in some perfect conditions. We're expecting more of the same today. I'll quickly run through the running order or roughly what we're expecting to see in a little while. But just wanted to say hello and welcome. And if you've not watched a Planes TV broadcast, introduce ourselves. So my name's Ian. I run Planes TV. We've got Adrian as well on the long lens today. Andy he's downstairs at the moment, uh, vision mixing. Um, but uh, we'll have a little swap around and he's going to hop on camera and I'll hop downstairs. So I'm wearing... Uh, Two microphones, two headsets, and all the rest of it. We're all doing multitasking here, um, as is uh, often the case. But a three-man team bringing you live coverage of the air show this afternoon, which gets underway in about half an hour's time. thing kicking us off is uh, gravity. Now, we were hoping to catch them uh, yesterday, but they were over down the VIP area there. So these are the guys with the, the jetpacks, so jet engines on the back and arms. Um, where I think I understand correctly that that area you've just seen over uh, just behind so we're where are we we're on the low green the sea's over there the green's over there and there's an area uh, marked out for the gravity guys to use i believe and i wouldn't be surprised if we saw the red devils who were on later landing there but we shall see the beach is actually closed so that would be available as well potentially the reason being that that bring the, brings the crowd sort of back and uh, allows the display axis so the area that the aircraft are displaying you might be able to see on that camera the 230 meter line marked by pink boys. Um, everything's a bit closer to the low green because if the beach was open, people could potentially uh, step out as far as the, well, go for a swim potentially, and then you're pushing out the displays even further. So it brings everything a little bit closer to the town and gives everyone potentially a better view. So, yeah, excited to see that. Um, so I've said Red Devils. I've said gravity kicking off at about 20 past one. Um, then we'll see a pretty unique thing. I haven't seen this before. It's Team Raven and the Gazelle Squadron just playing together in formation. So we'll get at least one formation pass from those guys before Team Raven. Um, this is the RV8s. Uh, uh, how many of them? Are there seven, I think? I uh, have to check that. We'll see that in a little while. you see how uh, wrong I am. But a really, really nice display team. I did see them a little while back at Sidmouth. I was there spectator with the family and a really fantastic display team that really engages the young ones. Um, looking forward to seeing them at about two o'clock. Following them, we have the Strike Master pair. I was over at the airport today. There was one Strike Master on site already, so at least at least one available for the uh, display, um, but listed here still as a pair. Um, then we have Chinook. Uh, Team Raven 6 aircraft, Andy's telling me in my ear. Thank you, Andy. Um, Stripe Master Bear, Chinook, uh, OV-10 Bronco, BBMF in the form of two Spitfires. Don't know which ones. Then we had the Red Devils and potentially quite a fun uh, drop if they are using this uh, area marked out on the low green. It'd be certainly a challenge for the camera operators because they'll release over there, go over our head and down into the drop zone there. But who am, I to, who am I to suggest that's where they're landing? They might well be on the beach. We will see. Then Peter Troy Davis in the uh, auto gyro. We saw him last night in some gorgeous sunset conditions. We'll see him in some brighter light today. That's always a fun one. Uh, lots of uh, crazy, relatively low-level maneuvers in an auto gyro. Pretty unique uh, display on the circuit. And uh, one that captures the imagination of the audience as well. One I always like to see. Then we have Airborne Pyrotechnics back. Tim and Tom in their Grub 109s. No pyros, but smoke today, of course. Uh, similar routine to last night, but uh, again, a la uh, the brighter conditions allowing us to uh, see what's going on, maybe a touch better, but if you enjoy, if you like the idea of seeing the uh, firework version of their display, the reason they're called Airborne Pyrotechnics, we were, of course, live last night, so you can check out that display. Then we have the Gazelle formation, so the Gazelle, Gazelle Squadron, who were will be uh, on fairly early with Team Raven. They're on again with their formation display uh, around about four o'clock. Then I see uh, Team Starling, the Starlings, the Cap 232 and Extra, uh, about 4.30. SC5, these are slightly old timing, so maybe the order's vaguely like this, and we know air shows 
it can move around a bit. But uh, just to give you an idea, expecting Team Starling in the early after late afternoon. SE5 replica, then the Rolls Royce Heritage pair. I'm assuming Mustang Spitfire. RAF Typhoon and then the Red Arrows closing out the show. Uh, I see them listed here as 5.30 but I've also seen 5 o'clock mentioned so there's pretend, I'm not sure on the timing of that so stay with us in the afternoon for the Typhoon and Red Arrows closing out the show. As I say I'll be downstairs during the live broadcast. I'll be vision mixing but also keeping an eye on the live chat so welcoming any new members and I did notice a few come through uh, just late, la late yesterday that I didn't get a chance to welcome. But thank you if you've recently joined as a member on YouTube. That's a paid membership system. Encourages me to do a bit more here on YouTube. We do also have, of course, our streaming service. That w That's a watch.planestv.com. It's like a Netflix for air show geeks like me. Um, that's where we output a lot of our, well, some of our live broadcasts out there. But if you're a regular viewer, you'll be bored of me saying that's where our back catalogue of air show action is. So things like, well, actually, uh, things like the Lucas shows. So coming up here to Lucas at this time of year, I'm reminded of um, doing so 10, 11, 12 years ago for the, the last of the Lucas shows. Um, I thought I'd uh, show you, and I did this yesterday as well, and we ran a little poll yesterday. I had two options, the Lucas 2012 Vulcan display at the air show that year. And I also offered the 2013 finale so of the very last Lucas Air Show 10 years ago. And we did a little poll, and there were quite a few votes, a couple of hundred votes, and it was pretty well 50 50. Um, so I thought I'd play them both back through again. So I did play this one yesterday, but I don't suppose you'll blame me sharing with you the Vulcan display at RF Lucas Air Show in 2012. Everyone looking to the east for the arrival of the mighty Avro Vulcan. Well, the Vulcan took to the air for the first time back in 1952, so he's actually sharing the Diamond Jubilee with Her Majesty the Queen. And indeed, at the coronation flypast, Royal Air Force Marham, the following year, 1953, one Vulcan participated in that flypast. There was only one airworthy at the time, the initial prototype. It's almost square, 97 feet long, 99 feet wide, and would normally contain a crew of five, a pilot, co-pilot, air electronics officer, navigator radar, and navigator plotter. not operating from the airfield here today. You can see that Captain Kev Rumans has lowered the undercarriage. The aircraft configured for landing. So not quite the end of the Vulcan display this afternoon. Just one more opportunity this afternoon to admire this quite amazing piece of great British engineering.
majestic display, but simply nothing like it. A rare and very welcome fly past by B-52 Strato Fortress from the United States Air Force. So sharing with you there some uh, Scottish air, sh air show action from over a decade ago. So that was Lucas 2012, the Vulcans display, and I couldn't resist including the B-52, which followed its display at Lucas that year. Two Cold War bombers, iconic aircraft of, uh, well, of the Cold War, but of course the B-52 still going strong. So I did share it with you yesterday, but I couldn't resist uh, doing so again. There were the vote we did yesterday between 2013 and 2012 was pretty evenly balanced so I thought I'd do that again. So that's a clip from our Lucas 2012 program. These are edited highlight programs from our shows which was kind of our bread and butter. It's what we did for three decades really and they'd be released on DVD and Blu-ray and they're now of course all available on our streaming service. So thank you if you are a subscriber at watch.planestv.com. That helps us keep going of course doing new shows bringing you the likes of the Royal International Air Tattoo on that service keeping the back catalogue available for people to view and uh, in just one week's time we'll also be live broadcasting the Duxford Battle of Britain Air Show through that service so if you were inclined to check out some of those Lucas shows perhaps some of the others from the early 90s some real nostalgic air show action on there if you signed up now you would also get access to that stream next weekend a busy period for us at the moment we're up here in Scotland having been down in Bournemouth south coast last week I'll be back down to the south coast middle of next week to hop on the ferry down to Jersey. We'll be live broadcasting that show Thursday afternoon and then a separate team will be going out to the Czech Republic to NATO days to cover that show over Saturday and Sunday. Well, it will be covering arrivals as well. Providing a camera for their live broadcast on the NATO days YouTube channel. So broadcasting from four different nations over the course of 10 days. A pretty busy period for Planes TV bringing our season towards a close. We do have one more show in October, the Duxford uh, Flying Finale. I've got the 14th of October in my head. Someone can tell me if that's a Saturday. Um, round about there, we'll be over at Duxford for the end of their 50th display season. And if all goes to plan, we'll have recorded every single moment of every single flying display at Duxford in their 50th display season. Much of it available here on YouTube. But as I say, some of it, the bigger shows, the June and uh, the June Summer Air Show and the Battle of Britain Air Show next weekend on our streaming service at watch.planestv.com. So yeah, really proud to have covered all of the Ducks for Flying action this year and we'll be looking forward to, to be honest, we're slightly looking forward to pushing through this quite busy period. It's quite a stressful thing to organise all of the logistics of two separate teams in three different countries over the course of 10 days, but air shows will happen on the same weekend. This is what we have to do, um, but thrilled to be covering all of them and we're grateful for those air shows having us, of course. I see lots of people commenting about Vulcan. Emma saying she never got to see the Vulcan display, but her dad did. Um, and someone else saying, imagine if the Vulcan came out of retirement. Well, it had already did that, so I'm afraid it's done that. And it's come and gone, I'm afraid. But we did have a wonderful, gosh, how many years was it? About seven years of um, sort of post-restoration flying of that aircraft. So, uh, we, we did an awful lot of traveling following it around. If you are on the streaming service, another plug but a uh, good program on there is the Vulcan Effect. That was probably one of the busier years. And actually the Vulcan Farewell to Flight program as well was uh, yeah, quite a poignant year. And we're, the kit we were using in those years, it, it, was, um, it made for some pretty good uh, coverage of the, a very busy display season of Vulcan. So yeah, lots of action uh, of that aircraft on the streaming service if you fancy l reliving it. Lovely to see John in the chat. I know you were hoping to be down at Kemble, Cotswold Airport, for the Buccaneer Fast Taxi, which um, you kindly helped arrange as cover last, it would have been winter, was it sort of more November time? But my understanding is the Buccaneer uh, not fast taxiing today and uh, taking place at another time. Maybe you can tell me in the chat. I can explain to people why that's happening. But if you're not familiar, there are two Buccaneer aircraft um, still running 
fast taxiing, uh, having moved from Bruntingthorpe to Cotswold Airport a couple of years ago, was it 2020? And uh, yeah, it was really thrilling to go watch that aircraft fast taxi last winter, hoping to get back down there again at some point. I can see people sharing stories of uh, Scampton in the 80s, uh, which predates me. Um, yeah, I saw the Vulcan at Gransden. Yeah, wow, that must have been a, a nice setting. And other people are asking about what year and where. So the, the Vulcan was here was, uh, yeah, Lucas in 2012. One other clip I have I'll show you in a little while is Lucas 2013. So that was the last year of RF Lucas, 10 years ago now. Time has flown, but I thought it would be nice to look back. Maybe it's just a personal thing, but, you know, coming up to Scotland at this time of year, it does make me think of those fantastic shows that we saw at RF Lucas. Sadly, no more, but I'll share with you the finale of the very last Lucas Air Show in just a little while. Now, the kick, we're kicking off with the flying here in about uh, 20 minutes' time, so still a little while to go. And we'll be kicking off with Gravity, uh, what do they call it? Gravity Aero System, something like that, I think, but the Jetpack guys. Um, I think we're going to have a lovely view of them, unlike last night when they were over by the, the VIP area. We had the hot air balloon setting up in this area, so kind of makes sense, as I think Gareth pointed out in the chat. Um, so we'll have a good view of those guys uh, doing their hover demonstration of the jetpacks, and they'll kick off at 20 past, and then we'll move into flying display proper with, uh, yeah, the Gazelle Squadron with Team Raven. Um, so a little while to go till the flying starts. I mentioned last night the hot air balloon and gravity, who we couldn't see, but we could see the Typhoon, the wonderful airborne pyrotechnics, and uh, also gyro as well over the sea here and with a lovely backdrop of the sun, sunset and the evening light. I thought I'd share with you some of the highlights of that show. So I've just managed a one minute edit of what went on last night. If you weren't tuned in, I thought I'd share it with you, see what you missed. So a lovely view of uh, last night's flying display in some really perfect conditions. Couldn't ask for better. Um, we've sort of come up north and to, I mean, I know the whole country is quite warm at the moment for September. Uh, we're up north and it is still warm, a little bit cooler and pretty nice really. It was sort of 20 degrees while we were knocking down last night at 9 o'clock at night. Maybe not quite that high, but some really perfect conditions. Weather today, it is breezier, so expecting round about 20 knot gusts, I think, and we're probably experiencing that now um, by the feel. Um, gradually reducing during the day, but from around about an hour, an hour's time onwards, there is a good potential of a shower or two. Um, nothing too horrendous and probably not going to stick around for terribly long, but um, could be a little bit disruptive, but um, nothing we're not used to especially if you've watched our air tattoo coverage, you'll know we'll cope with pretty well anything. Um, I can see who gave me a little, uh, oh, it was Connor, um, give me a little weather forecast for the following week, because uh, we're all busy. We're going to be looking at weather forecasts across Europe to see what we're going to be faced with. It's looking pretty good at the moment, Connor reckons. So pretty light winds and warm conditions for Jersey. 
I take everything to every air show. So the fact of 50 plus sun creams on and the weatherproofs are all down, the waterproofs are all downstairs ready to go if they need to. I'm afraid that's just the uh, nature of uh, outdoor, outdoor events in the UK or pretty well anywhere, let's face it. Mark mentioning that Blackpool was hit with a thunderstorm late morning and affecting the flying display there, unfortunately. Well, the Southport flying display, I suppose, but uh, aircraft facing out of Blackpool. Um, that sort of, well, that's a lower band, but there is a band out to our southwest that I'm eagerly looking at on the rainfall radar. Uh, where's southwest? So southwest over there looks pretty fine at the moment, to be honest. Nice bit of blue sky. It's just one of those days where you may just get unlucky with a heavy downpour. We'll see. We will see. So, I see Emma saying they enjoyed the brilliant performances and camera work. Thank you, Emma. I'll pass that on to the guys. Well, they've heard me already. Um, you may be able to hear in the background uh, Joe, who's going to be the Esho commentator. So, it's nice to give you a sort of personal introduction. This is my channel, if you like, and it's nice to uh, just touch base and say hello and everything. But I'm grateful that uh, we've got an air show commentator taking you through the flying displays this afternoon. That's Joe McGrath. Yeah, Kevin's saying the red's unable to display at Southport. That's a shame, isn't it? A real shame. Yeah, it's just the way sometimes, I'm afraid. And you often, you often find yourself wondering, well, can't they wait till the weather's a bit better and display later? Well, of course, they have other commitments, including a display up here. So the logistics of uh, displays often uh, reducing the flexibility in those sorts of scenarios. Kent is 33 degrees C. Well, I'll settle for our 22 degrees C up here. I'll be honest. That's plenty warm enough. Thank you very much. 31, someone else saying, and 30 degrees. Yeah, I mean, these are lovely temperatures to be enjoying a dip in the sea or something. But when you're outside uh, covering a show, it's, I'm often grateful for weather not being too hot. It can get pretty ridiculous. Florida, USA is cool, says Noah. Interesting. That's an early start for you. Oh, maybe not too bad by this stage. Yeah, lovely to see so many of you joining the chat, around about a thousand of you watching. Hey, now's a good time to give the video a like. Uh, it does help YouTube decide that we're worth watching. So give the video a like if you haven't done already. I'll encourage other people to tune in. I can see, uh, we're, uh, well, this takes a while to update. I can see a couple of hundred likes at the moment. Let's see if we can push that up to a thousand today. I'm sure that's not uh, beyond the realms of possibility. I should say um, South Ayrshire Council are running this show and uh, a charity partner of the air show is the Royal Air Force Benevolent Fund. So they pop by earlier. They have, if you're coming to the show today, they have two areas. They have, um, uh, I forget what they called it, but the sort of support area over in the corner, but also the, uh, the sort of more fun area where you can go buy your uh, um, memorabilia and um, toys and things for the kids. The Royal Air, Sp Royal Air Force Benevolent Fund here raising funds for um, the support work that they do for the RAF family. They spent £17.5 million in 2022 supporting ex well, serving RAF, ex-RAF and their families, all sorts of welfare work that that charity does. If you're watching at home, not here at air and not able to go and visit the charity themselves, you can check out the RAF Benevolent Fund website. That's raf.org.uk, correction, RAFBF. .org.uk and you'll find them with the same Twitter handle RFBF and um, yeah wonderful charity does wonderful work supporting their as, as I say serving personnel ex Royal Air Force personnel and their families so a partner charity for the air show here and we're yeah it's wonderful to see that partnership it really does make sense to uh, make the most of the audience here on site and hopefully you guys at home if you felt like checking out the Royal Air Force Benevolent Fund the wonderful work that they do and potentially uh, look you can look to ways you, you might want to support that wonderful charity so flying action starting in around about 10 minutes time i promised you a bit more lucas so why don't we go take a look at that as i say coming up here at this time of year it takes me back to those wonderful shows at lucas we did live broadcast i think this last show so you might scroll down on youtube and find the full live broadcast but this segment is actually from our edited program another one available on our streaming service it's the RAF Lucas Air Show 2013 and the sort of closing ceremony with Lancaster, Tornado, Typhoon and plenty of marching and bag bagpipes on the ground. So let's wind the clock back 10 years to the finale at RAF Lucas Air Show. Celebrating the 70th anniversary of one of the most daring bomber raids ever launched, 
the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight Lancaster, wearing World War II markings of 617 Squadron aircraft, Thumper Mark III, and a Tornado GR4 from the current 617 Squadron. I give you the 70th anniversary Dan Buster fly past. So as the Lancaster taxis down the runway, we have one final commemorative fly past for you. 6-1 squadron, 6-1-7 squadron of today, saluting 6-1-7 squadron of yesterday. So as the Tornado GR4 departs to your left-hand side, we do move into our finale, the traditional sunset ceremony. And so, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, that final fly past, Typhoon and Tornado departing to the north, bringing to a close the 2013 and last RAF Lucas air show. So a good bit of air show nostalgia there from RAF Lucas in 2013. Ten years ago since uh, the last show there, we did know at that point it was going to be the last show, so everyone put on uh, their best effort to put on a great show and uh, yeah hope you enjoyed that little segment that's come from our streaming service the lucas 2013 show at watch.planestv.com and um, thank you all for joining the chat it is wonderful to uh, sort of share the experience of an air show live broadcast through the, through the chat it's nice uh, checking in with everyone seeing how everyone's enjoying it and um, angus talking about uh, react this year the royal international air tattoo back in july well actually no he's talking about last year which was crazy hot we're talking about temperatures around the country today and the fact that we're a bit cooler up here well as i see last year was pretty exhausting and as a result of last year i decided i'd get all the sun cream prep for this year so that we were covered for 
similar conditions. Of course, we didn't get them this year. It was pretty soggy. Got the opposite end of the weather spectrum. Uh, lots of heavy rain and uh, strong winds, unfortunately. But still some great flying in between. Speaking of flying, we are expecting to see some flying in about five minutes' time here at air. So I'll be hopping downstairs and doing the, lo doing the vision mixing in a little while. Um, expecting to see the gravity guys with the jetpacks in this area just over... Just over uh, this way. Um, can't see them yet. And there's, there's slight nervousness in my voice because last night we, we just didn't, weren't sure where they were going to display at all. They're over near the VIPs over there with a hot air balloon here. But I'm reassured that they're over in this compound today and there's lots of security people milling around making sure nobody goes into it. You need the space, obviously, from uh, the jetpack guys. Give them plenty of room to manoeuvre. Um, so I'm expecting to give you a good view of that in around about four minutes' time. Yeah, so following them, I'll run you through it again. We're expecting the Gazelle Squadron with Team Raven. Interesting uh, grouping of six RVs with the Gazelles uh, displaying after the Gravity Guys. Uh, who else did I see in the chat? There was one other thing I wanted to mention. Oh, just hello to Alan from uh, watching from Germany. I'm sure you're not the furthest afield. In fact, I saw someone in Florida as well. So thank you for tuning in from further afield. I was getting the commentator to give us a shout out yesterday uh, to the spectators here uh, he was asking who's come the furthest well i am as i stand now 450 miles away road miles from my office so i thought i might be uh, the furthest one but i have just spoken to the royal air force benevolent fund they've got, come up from london i think they're probably fifth pretty evens on that one um but they flew up so that's cheating i towed my trailer up the m5 so m6 sean saying they've got their react tickets for next year Hoping for better weather. It is always a good show, though, and it's always that dilemma of should you go for one day, should you sort of fork out for, for more. We make uh, every effort every effort we can to re basically record everything. So we're there from uh, the Wednesday for the start of arrivals right the way through to, to departures. And if you're familiar with the output the, the, of uh, Planes TV, you'll have watched maybe some of those arrivals, departures, the rehearsals, which are quite spectacular in their own right often during the build-up to the show weekend proper all of that output on youtube for each of you um yeah looking forward to next year on that one too hey we've got new zealand checking in i think that wins it doesn't it i don't suppose there's many people from further <laughs> can you get further away i'd love to see the map nice to see you joining in richard from uh, new zealand we've got santorini connecticut usa hey it's lovely to think that little old air up here i shouldn't de demean air in that way it's a beautiful place and if you've not visited this corner of the country do you consider aaron over there just a spectacular place to spend new year as i discovered a few years ago um yeah some beautiful scenery on the way up here a lovely corner of the world and uh yeah i think uh i think the show's in the calendar they're sort of hoping that this is um the show back in action and we're expecting to see it in future so do consider a visit in future years so we've got two minutes to go. I could, can now see, to my great relief, a bloke with jet engines on his back and on his arms. So that's fabulous to see over in the right-hand corner there. We can see uh, gravity ready to go. So I think what I'll probably do is hand you, well, basically get downstairs to do my real job this weekend, which is vision mixing what's going on. And I'll say thank you very much for tuning in. If you haven't already done so, do subscribe to us on YouTube. We'll be live again from Jersey on Thursday. We'll be live at Duxford on our on-demand streaming service at watch.planestv.com. And if you feel like tuning in to some of the NATO Days coverage, that will be going out on YouTube on their, um, on the NATO Days uh, channel on, on there. That's a show in, the, in, che in Czechia, I should say, rather than Czech Republic now. Um, wonderful NATO show. Lots of uh, heavy metal military action uh, over the Saturday and Sunday of next week. So a busy period. I hope you can uh, tune in to some of it. If you're not already on the email newsletter list, there's a link in the description. You can click that and sign up for email newsletters from me. It is me that sends them and you can reply to them and we can have a little chat about uh, our outputs or things you would like to see us doing. It's a nice way for me to sort of engage with you guys and uh, adjust our outputs uh, based on your feedback. Oh, well done, Nick. Tuning in from Australia as well. I can hear jet engines spooling up. I'm going to hand over to Joe, who's going to take you through the event commentary. I might pop in from time to time. 
But I'll say goodbye and let Adrian pick up the jetpack, which is in the far corner there. Uh, five jet turbines on her jet suit. She's got about 20 litres of Jet A1 jet fuel, and she's going to be launching in about 15 seconds. So, away we go, Gravity Industries. So Rowan's just going to have a little bit of a shakedown, I think, just have a little bit of a relax because that jet suit is wearing weighs about 35 kilograms. So all going to plan, we're going to have another, another go, another circuit round when Rowan is ready. So here we go. So, Dr. Jeff, can you tell me roughly how long can this fly for? You know, what's well, the range? So, you're talking about two minute flight time, and as we can see, because I've talked, Roman's just landed now. So, give it up, everyone, for Rowan Poulter from Gravity Industries. So, we're just saying there that the, the jet suit there has got about 20 litre jet A1 fuel capacity. That's about two and a half to three minute flight time. And if you want to chat to, to Rowan, Chat to the team, have some photographs, make your way to the STEM marquee. That's where they are going to be. In fact, hang on a minute, or are we going to go for it? We're going for another one, actually, Joe. We're off again. So this is like the first iteration of this design, and it's developing all the time, and I'm sure they're going to work on the range, make it last longer. Yeah, it is indeed, Joe. And for those of you that can actually hear what we're saying, this is the Mark 2.5 version. So we've got two turbines on Rowan's arms, about 220 newtons of thrust each, and on the back it's a great big 550 newton thrust turbine. And I think that is, that is Rowan done. There you go everybody, Rowan Poulter from Gravity Industries. Well that's a great idea. Fan fantastic job, well done guys, that's absolutely phenomenal. I can't wait for the day when they develop a version where we can go out, have a few beers and then just strap that on and head on home down the road. Well, that would be a great idea, wouldn't it? Instead of calling an Uber, strap well, that on your back. Well, funnily enough, Joe, I was actually chatting to, to Rowan yesterday and I said, do they do a version for 50-year-old blokes that weigh 14 stone? <laughs> and she actually said, we're developing something that almost anybody can fly. You don't need to be wow. a gymnast or a rock climber, so I'm first in the queue for that one. Yeah, because you've really got sort of three points of thrust. You've got the thrust coming from your back and then the thrust coming from your wrists as well. So you've got to have good balance, I would think, to control that. She made it look very easy, but it's, it's, it's very skillful. It is, and I was fortunate enough to, to try the suit on yesterday when we were doing a demo at Presswick Airport, and it's, it's heavy. It's you know, a good 35 kilos, and 
what Rome was telling me was that when you actually lift off, you actually lean forward onto the forearms. That's so you, very counterintuitive, isn't it? You it think, is. oh, I don't yeah. want to lean, I'm going to fall on my Yeah, face. you're going to fall over. So yeah. you, you have to trust the technology. And that's very much oh, what we're talking about over this weekend with the, with the air show, the, the science, technology, engineering, and maths. So that's a huge part of the air show and what we're doing. So make your way across to the STEM marquee. That's where Rowan and Gravity Industries will be. So if you're watching them now, making their way back, Rowan and the team are really happy to chat to you and to talk to you. Uh, but give us some space and watch out for those jet turbines because they are very, very hot. They get to about 750 degrees C, operating at about 114 revs per minute. So they are very, very serious bits of technology. But you can go and chat to, to Rowan, chat to, to Ryan as well, who's also one of Gravity Industries' leading pilots. And in fact, they've got eight pilots, Joe, believe it or not, in the UK. And, and Rowan is the only female pilot, which is why we asked that they come here to display today. Yeah, I've seen them uh, before overseas, and uh, they came in pairs there and hopped around uh, the air show in Dubai and uh, in Saudi, and they are pretty amazing. But like you said, it takes a, a lot of skill, so it's good that they're building up a cadre of pilots that uh, will be able to take that technology forward, and hopefully, as you said, in the future, they're working on different versions that will auto-stabilize, uh, so you don't have to... Uh, be uh, that skillful but still obviously and also range range would be a thing to to work on i saw once on on the news they they, got, they had a, a paramedic didn't he go up the side of a hill with one of these to get to a, a casualty yeah so so their main use actually is for search and rescue that's very much what they've been designed to do but the royal marines also have found a, a, a niche use for them as well the royal marines have got a number of these so so clearly they've got quite a diverse application um, but they're really, really good bits of kit. And one of the things that we're trying to think about here at the air show over the next five years is about how you reduce the carbon emissions because that's a hugely important factor. And Gravity actually have a battery-powered electric ducted fan version as well, as well as their jet turbine version. So we're going to try and see if we can maybe get hold of that at some point in the future. That'll be interesting to look at. Absolutely. So as Jeff said, if you want to uh, meet the future, get over to the STEM uh, tent. Uh, it's just to the left of the BAC, the big black uh, BAC uh, trailer over there, and uh, talk to the pilots and have a look hands-on with the technology. Maybe get your picture taken next to it. So uh, that's uh, a sort of flying start, but uh, we're more traditional type of flying will be starting very shortly. And uh, the weather is... Uh, a little bit windy. We've got what's called an on-crowd wind, which isn't ideal. It's going to mean that the uh, display pilots are going to be extending out a little bit because as they turn, they'll be blown towards us and they have a display line. You see those very distinctive uh, pink cushions out there in the uh, sea, in the Firth of Clyde. Well, they're uh, actually the display line, those three in the middle. That's crowd center, and that's reference points for the pilots to fly to. So uh, we don't want to see them the other side of those... Uh, inflatables and with the heavier jets with the like the typhoon and the red arrows you'll see them they'll extend even further because the heavier and the faster an aircraft is the more distance they have to keep from uh, the crowd line itself uh, but coming up uh, in about half an hour's time the flying display will start um, that will be team raven and gazelle team arriving in pairs so they're going to uh, come up and down the flight line uh, together and uh, then they're going to break off the gazelles are going to go back and land before they come back later on this afternoon and display and team raven will then carry on and do their full display as well so uh, flying is going to start in uh, roughly uh, about half an hour we have to say a huge thanks to uh, our sponsors who are helping us uh, put on this amazing free show of course, uh, South Ayrshire Council uh, are the main driving force, and they're the organisers that have brought us all together uh, here to uh, present the International Air Show Festival of Flight 2023. But Ashley Scotland Limited are our main sponsors, and uh, Ashley Scotland Limited are a locally based main contractor covering a diverse range of construction products. And uh, the sectors that they're involved in include affordable housing, residential, education, healthcare, leisure and industrial and uh, they're very proud to uh, be employing the local supply chain 
providing huge opportunities there. They've all provided uh, over the years, and they have a strong belief in uh, the apprenticeship and the professional training uh, schemes that they're running as well. And they're delighted to be the main sponsors of the International Air Show Festival of Flight and uh, bringing this fantastic wealth of benefit to the local areas. They're thrilled to be involved. They have a, a long relationship with South Ayrshire Council and hope to continue that for many, many years to come. Also, we have to say a big thank you to Spirit Aero Systems. Spirit Aero Systems is one of the world's largest manufacturers of aero structures, serving the commercial, aviation, defense, and regional business jet sectors. Spirit's expertise extends across aluminum and advanced composite manufacturing, and the company's core products include fuselage, integrated wings, wing components, pylons, and nacelles. The company has uh, locations in uh, the US, in France, Malaysia, in uh, Morocco, Northern Ireland, and of course uh, more locally up in Presswick, where a thousand people are employed in a diverse range of skills including engineering, procurement, finance, and uh, more. So to learn more about the incredible work and the contributions to the aerospace industry and the work that they do in the local community, you can visit them in the STEM marquee that I was talking about earlier. Spirit are in there and they're proud to be sponsors of the International Festival of Air Show. If you haven't got one already, make sure you get yourself a program. The souvenir programs are on sale and that gives you a full rundown of uh, all the flying that's taking on today. Also interviews with uh, some of the teams and some of the pilots and uh, also you uh, have to go and see the guys at the Royal Air Force Benevolent Fund who are our official sponsors, uh, or sorry, our official charity uh, this weekend. And uh, of course the work that they do, the Royal Air Force Benevolent Fund is uh, the RF's leading welfare charity and their whole reason to be is to support current and foreign members of the Royal Air Force and their partners and their dependents. So uh, if you uh, do uh, have time, please do pop over and uh, have a look at their uh, chalet, which is uh, near to the uh, Royal Air Force village, with that full mock-up of the typhoon, which you'll be seeing flying later on this afternoon.
good afternoon if you've just joined us on Plains TV. Thank you very much for doing so. Oh, I've just realised I'm outputting loads of commercial music, which is a bit of a no-no on YouTube. So forgive me as I bring in a bit of the familiar background music um, for us to enjoy whilst we wait for the flying to start in around about 20 minutes time, kicking off with Gazelle, the Gazelle Squadron flying with Team Raven. I can see a good 1,600 people tuning in, so thank you for doing so. Do give the video a like. That really helps us at this stage of the day. So giving the video a like at this stage of the day might just encourage other people who enjoy this sort of thing to tune in. And I can see lots of people see lots of people tuning in on the chat, so thank you very much for doing so. Um, I'm taking a look at that, so my name's Ian. I'm down in the trailer mixing the output. I see Adrian's on camera one picking up. What's that? A flock of, I'm going to say geese here, but I dare say there's some bird spotters who are going to tell me they're, oh, they look pretty much like geese. They've got to be right. Our, first, our second display act, a flock of geese over the sea here at air. And then we've got Andy chasing jet skis as well. He's on camera too today. And I'm stuck down here in the air conditioning, enjoying, uh, well, enjoying the sight of my sandwich, which I might get a chance to eat at some point. But yeah, thank you very much for tuning in and thank you for all of those who've given the video a like. It does help us at this point of the day. If you like the output on Planes TV, you can subscribe, of course. It's a good thing to do. Increases the likelihood that you'll see a bit of a notification of when we do go live, which we will be doing so on a Thursday next week with the Jersey Air Display in the afternoon on Thursday. And we'll also be live from Duxford on our streaming service, so watch.planestv.com. And we'll also have a team out in Czechia for NATO Days, big NATO show out in Czech Republic. I'll be Andy and myself, so uh, yeah, home for a couple of days and then out there for a, a really intense, uh, I think four or five days out there, recording arrivals and the main uh, flying display out there. So a busy period for Planes TV as we come toward the end of our summer season, uh, but we will be live again on YouTube for the Duxford flying finale in the middle of October. If you've been with us for the last hour and you're wondering why I'm going through it all again it's because a great deal <laughs> great many people have uh, joined the broadcast so just filling in all those who've uh, joined in the last few minutes and if you miss the gravity guys you can wind uh, wind back on YouTube and uh, see the hovering jetpack in the arena here really nice um, setup there that sort of exhibition area in the crowd giving enough space for the jetpack demonstration Everyone around there getting a good view and hopefully us sharing one with you too. Yeah, lovely to see so many in the chat. Ashley's stuck in traffic. Sorry to hear that, Ashley. At least you're able to watch in on uh, Plains TV, hey? Hope the rest of your journey goes okay. Who else can I see? Yeah, lovely to see so many regulars. Alley Cat on there as well. And Harry Paul was with us last night. A breeze up on the hill, keeping us cool. So where are you, Harry Paul? There is a bit of a breeze down here. I think gusting 20 knots or there or thereabouts. Thank you to David Milligan, who's just become a member on YouTube. Membership. Actually, last weekend gave access to our Sunday live broadcast from Bournemouth. Sort of... It experimenting with uh, that as a potential way of bringing live broadcasts to you. Always trying to work out what works best for you and uh, frankly making commercial sense to us. So thank you for anyone signing up for Bournemouth last weekend and big thank you to David Milligan who's just signed up as a supporter, as a member on YouTube. You, you can do so by looking out for the join button and it makes a little financial contribution each month to Planes TV, encourages me to do more on YouTube. So big thank you to all our channel members for being members, encouraging me to do a bit more. 
A big thank you to anyone who's a subscriber on watch.planestv.com. That service providing our, uh, well, gives you access to our back catalogue. Not all of it though, I do need to get on and uh, capture a few more of our master tapes from the 90s. Some really great stuff there. I had, and I've got two tapes from Fairford 1993 sat on my desk that I'd hoped to um, digitise and be make available for the live broadcasts at the Royal International Air Tattoo this year. Didn't quite manage that, so they'll be first on the list once the season slows down a little bit and I get a bit more time sat in front of, front of a computer at home rather than a camera out here or a uh, steering wheel of the truck dragging this trader around. You are very welcome, Peter, saying thanks, Planes TV. Fred Zeppelin asking where this is. So we're in the northwest of, well, northwest of the UK, air in Scotland. Beautiful scenery, lovely setting for a show, as you'll have seen if you watched the live uh, broadcast of the evening display last night. The setting sun over the sea, providing a beautiful backdrop for displays that included the Autogyro, the Typhoon, airborne pyrotechnics with the fireworks off the wingtips. Gorgeous flying display last night. So yeah, air in Scotland, Aaron off the coast if it clears up a little bit. Yeah, Duxford say, uh, John saying that Duxford should be really good next week, and indeed it should. So it's Duxford's, as John points out, 50th display season, flying display season. We've recorded every single flying display this year there, including their flying days, which have been great fun to bring you here on YouTube. Next weekend, the Battle of Britain anniversary air show at Duxford. And that will go out on our streaming service at watch.planestv.com. So if you signed up there, thank you. And you'll have access to the afternoon's flying display on Saturday and Sunday. We're expecting lots of Spitfires, lots of Hurricanes, lots of other warbirds too. And as John points out, it's the f f Duxford, or the Imperial War Museum at Duxford have done 50 display seasons there. And we're expecting that to be a very well supported show as a result, as indeed should be the flying finale in October. Any air shows happening tomorrow? Is Southport tomorrow as well? I don't know. There almost certainly are. In fact, many of my colleagues are over in Europe at the moment covering the Milan, show at Milan and um, in Belgium as well. There's lots of shows going on in Europe. In fact, this is a very busy period this September. Can't tell you why, but there are always clashes. So we have two teams in separate locations over the next 10 days. Myself and Andy heading out to Czechia and the guys, a uh, couple of the guys, uh, basically half the React team is one place, half the, half the team is the other, as elsewhere. So those guys heading out to Jersey and then waiting for a nerve-wracking ferry to get them back to England to head up to Duxford on the Friday night. It's uh, all a bit uh, tight, I'll be honest, logistically, but uh, should be able to get through it okay. So if you're just tuning in, thank you for doing so. We've got about 12 minutes to run until the flying display starts. I can hear someone on the other side of the fence shouting Ian. So if you're watching the live stream and you're shouting the other side of the fence, thank you. Hello. I'm not going to open the door. It's far too cool and nice in here. I'll stay put. Thank you. Well, I can't see anyone. I would do. I would say hello. But I can't actually see anyone. can see lots of people enjoying the late summer warmth. We're a little cooler than the rest of the UK up here, which I do not mi mind. Connor pointing out that yes, Southport is tomorrow. Do you know, we haven't done Southport for years. I think I've still got sand in some of my equipment as a result of it being there a good 15 years ago, but uh, the main sort of um, spectator area being down on the beach. Big old beach to play with. Or it was that year anyway. I presume it's still the same. I think they're using, yeah, they use the beach as a bit of a runway, don't they? That was quite a spectacle with a good fly-in of lots of microlights and things. Don't know whether it's still the same. It's, as I say, been many years since we've covered Southport. You are very welcome, David. I think the new channel member just saying, enjoy the show, looking forward to it. Us too. I'll run through that running order again, and this is quite an old running order, I'll be honest. So there may well be changes, and as we know, 
weather and the likes can impact. So if had gravity, we'll have Team Raven and the Gazelle formation fly past. That's Team Raven with the RVs and the Gazelle aircraft, which I was over at the airport this morning. I can say they're all on site, raring to go. Then we have Team Raven with their six aircraft performing their fabulous formation aerobatic display. Followed by the Strike Master pair. Now there was one Strike Master on site. I don't know whether the other one's made it up yet, but certainly one of them was, on, uh, was at the airport this morning. Chinook, AV-10 Bronco, BBMF in the form of two Spitfires, Red Devils, and I'm hoping they'll be dropping into the uh, arena area that's been laid out on the low green here that we saw the gravity demonstration at earlier. I, it's my speculation, I'm not actually sure. Probably, I should probably ask the question. I am within uh, stone throwing distance of a flying display director, so I probably should go and ask the question, but I'd rather keep Adrian on his toes when he's following the Red Devils down. Should be fairly obvious once we get to that point with the drop zone, mo drop zone marked out. Maybe a flare and a bit of um, wind direction indicators set up for the guys jumping at, it says here, quarter past three, but we'll see when the time comes. Then we have the Auto Gyro, Airborne Pyrotechnics, Gazelle Squadron performing on their own at around about four. Starlings in the afternoon, about half four. Rolls-Royce Heritage Pair, Typhoon, and a red arrow is bringing the show to a close. Angus asking if I'll be doing Cosford next year. Don't know. Would love to. We did over a decade of shows at Cosford. Um, didn't manage to um, make an arrangement to cover the show this year, but um, it's it, you know it being the only Royal Air Force Air Show left, uh, it would be wonderful to cover that event. And I'd like to find a way of doing so. Uh, yeah, I'd like to like to find a way. Ah, I did wonder about that, Jerry. That's interesting, saying the fighter meet was cancelled. Sort of that that name familiar to old air show goers as an event held at North Weald, and I think that was the plan again. I wasn't actually conscious that it had been cancelled. That's a shame. It's a difficult venue to arrange anything like an air show at, but it would be nice to see... Um, certainly the name, if nothing else... Uh, brought back. Uh, we can see Adrian there. I can see Andy's got you a nice view of Adrian on top of the trailer there. I'm hidden away in there. I could probably open a blind and give you a wave if I could leap over the piles of equipment, but uh, I'll probably avoid that. But our trailer providing a really nice vantage point here. And quite an interesting angle on um, what's Adrian got. I'll show you what he's got. So his view, view is from the top there, so he's got a lovely, pretty well clear line of sight to most of the displays. A um, little limited by speaker poles and things. And they are serious speaker poles. You might be able to see their, their sort of stadium concert quality speaker speakers. So it um, gives me a bit of a challenge trying to avoid bringing you uh, commercial music over the stream. But that's always the fun of uh, these sorts of shows. So you might hear the live effect mics uh, being brought down if uh, we get some commercial music out coming out because I can't broadcast that over YouTube because I'm not licensed to do so and YouTube does not like it. Jet Fest would be cool. So I did do a Jet Fest. John makes mention of that, an event that took place at Northfield. Gosh, I feel like it might have been 2018, something like that. We had the Nat F1 uh, taxi demonstration, another, another aircraft I'm really hoping to see soon in the air. We don't have the Lancaster up here, Rich. Asking if we've got the Lancaster. It is just two Spitfires from the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight. I say just two Spitfires. We'll take anything we get. So Joe's just popped on on the commentary. I'll hand you over to him so he can maybe provide us a bit of an update. But thank you for tuning in. Got about five minutes to go. Do give this video a like and make sure you've subscribed here on YouTube. The Future Flying Action. Hand over to Joe now, see what he's got for you. Being from our right, so uh, get yourself positioned uh, up in the flight line. They'll be moving, uh, I think, coming in from the right-hand side. Uh, so if you want to get a picture of Team Raven and the Gazelles together, I think they're just doing two passes up and down, and then the Gazelle team will break off and head back to uh, the airport, and they'll land 
and Team Raven will start their uh, flying display. Still got time to do a few hellos from uh, everybody on Instagram that was sending me messages. Joe Airshow at Instagram, if you want to say hello. This is from uh, Tony Rafferty. He wants to give a shout out for his little boy, Mason Rafferty. And apparently this is his first time ever to the Air Air Show. So I uh, hope you're having a good time, you and Dad. Holly says, hiya. That's it. That was the message. Hiya. You're not a big woman on detail, are you, Holly? And uh, also I got one from uh, uh, Darcy. Uh, he wants to do a shout out for uh, Uncle Mickey and Auntie Lou uh, that are bringing to the show today. Kathleen as well. Shout out to Stuart Franks. Back in air for the love of his planes. <laughs> that says a lot. So uh, Stuart's come back to air because he loves his planes. Uh, well done, you, Stuart. I hope you're enjoying the show, and uh, it's going to continue all the way through till 5.30 this afternoon when the Red Arrows will be closing the show. Noel Stafford uh, sent me an Instagram at Joe Air Show. He wants to say a big hello to the Stafford family who came all the way from Aberdeen, Motherwell, uh, Ockley Tree, I think that is, and Alloway. Thanks. That's nothing, mate. We have a woman here that has come apparently all the way from Buenos Aires. We were chatting with her yesterday. So uh, it's not that far when you think about that Aberdeen now, is it? So uh, get yourself positioned because very shortly we're going to be start flying in less than 10 minutes' time. And uh, the full flying display for the International Air Show Festival of Flight 2023 will begin very, very shortly. Yes, that's Joe McGrath. He's going to be taking us through the flying display event commentary proper. I'm really just filling in whilst uh, he's playing music over the speakers. Um, Andy, I can, Andrew, I can see on the chat asking if we've ever been snowed on at a show. And I think the closest we've come to that is probably... Um, uh, the one that pops to mind is, is actually the Buccaneer Fast Taxi last year, which um, John, who's also in the chat, helped arrange. Um, lovely to cover, but it was a cool day. I didn't mind at all when that buccaneer started up and started blasting us with uh, jet flux. Um, not snow, though. I suppose the other one comes springs to mind is actually NATO days last year was uh, crazy. We were talking, so we put, took poor old Ben Donnell out to provide English commentary for a English language live broadcast. And the morning, I remember him sat there and he was checking the weather, and it was six degrees. Um, for the start of the day, which made things pretty uncomfortable for all of us, as you can imagine, but no snow. I'm looking closely at the uh, forecast at the moment for next week, see if we're going to get anything similar, but it's looking okay at the moment. Um, yeah, fairly moderate temperatures. Certainly if this weather continues. So Germany, that's pretty close, Alan. 30 degrees at the moment, so don't imagine it's much dissimilar in Czechia. And uh, yeah, long may that last for next weekend. I took my wife out for uh, that show one year, and I actually I promised I didn't promise warm weather, but I didn't I didn't uh, mention that it can get fairly cold out in Central Europe in sort of mid-September. Oh yeah, you know, it's not, not no similar to the UK really, is it? But it was a cool old show that year as well, I can tell you. That was 10 years ago. And uh, she still talks about it. Um, yeah, long may these 30 degrees. Gosh, 34 in Kent at the moment, says Emma. So it's not quite as cool, as warm up here. But it's shorts and t-shirt weather, certainly for the locals. Um, and yeah, fine weather conditions. Ready for the display, which is going to start very shortly. Now, my title there says in a flying starts in a minute and a half. That's based on a running order I was given about a week ago. So all sorts could have changed. So to cover myself, I'll get rid of that. And we'll just say, keep your eyes on the sky, ready for some flying. So I've got Adrian and Andy on lookout, ready to pick up the gazelle guys. If you're at home, quite often people uh, spot things on flight radar or ADS ADSB exchange earlier than we manage. Andy reporting that the FTD's uh, got eyes on the horizon, so he's expecting something inbound very shortly. I 
I'm just bringing up flight radar to see if I can um, spot anything. So I can see one aircraft in the air. That is an RV. That's out to the south of air. That'll be over our left shoulders. So I'm anticipating aircraft arriving from our left. It's just one aircraft um, pinging on uh, ADSB exchange. I imagine that Adrian will get sight of that aircraft in the next uh, couple of minutes. Currently live on. radar's got them as well. Yeah, so if you are watching on uh, ADSB, exchange, uh, ADSB Exchange or uh, similar and you want to update us on uh, where things are and when they're coming from, um, you can do in the chat. I'll be keeping a monitor on that or I'll try to. I've got four screens in front of me and I can watch one and a half at a time, but I'll try my best. I've just glanced at one of them, which shows me that Russell Spears has made a super chat of 4.99. Thank you so much, Russell. Every little helps. I might just feed the guys after all. Thank you for that. His comment saying, heard rumours that folks were moaning that the typhoon display was too loud yesterday. Wish I was there, but stuck at work. I'm sorry to hear that, Russell. I hope you're able to tune in throughout the afternoon today. I can promise you that the typhoon will be loud, and I make no apology for that. And you can see our next display, our first proper display. So Adrian's uh, trying to pick them up. And I dare say Joe will spot them in a moment too. So I'll probably hand over to him as soon as I hear, start hearing him talking. So I'll, uh, Adrian's just said, oh wow. So that's a very good sign. And so what we're expecting to see is, um, yeah, okay. And he's got them. There we go. Right. Enjoy the show, everybody see the aircraft approaching leading is the gazelle formation team and then behind them is the orv8 the raven team so officially now we are opening up the second day of flying and welcome to the international air show festival of flight 2023 so raven in the lead and the gazelles Slotted in behind, smoke on. Get your photos now because uh, they won't be doing that many passes in that configuration. And what you're seeing here are the cream of British displays, but both of them are private display teams. Both of them will uh, be having civilian and military pilots. Raven team, for instance, have an international rugby player as one of their pilots. And I'll go through the uh, Gazelle team later on when they come back. So they're going to do, I've just been told by the flight display director, Les, that they're going to do a complete orbit, come back. Lots of boats there, I've just noticed. Wow, that's a good way of seeing the show. So, uh, as I said earlier, this is not ideal for flying displays because we have what's called an on-crowd wind. So you'll see a lot of the uh, teams will be extending outwards uh, because they don't want to blow past the... Uh, display markers that we've seen there and uh, it's gusting as well so uh, but it's still well within limits so get your cameras ready they're going to do a straight in approach slightly off wind team raven breaking to the right and the gazelle helicopters breaking to your left awesome what an opener now the gazelles We'll be heading off. They're going to depart back to Prestwick, and uh, Team Raven are going to then hook around to the left. They're going to climb to height, and uh, I'll start telling you a little bit about that team. As I said, they're uh, not all military pilots that will be displaying here today, and uh, this team is uh, the epitome of that. We have uh, Sid, uh, Simon Sid Sherrill. Everyone calls him Sid Sherrill. He's uh, leading, it's his 10th season as a display pilot. He's a former uh, Royal Air Force jet pilot with about 5,500 hours, done multiple tours on the Tornado, as, as well as a QFI tours on the Hawk, the Grob Shooter with the University Air Squadrons and the Grob 20s. So a very seasoned pilot across many 
uh, factors of it. He now serves as a full-time reservist, uh, QFI, and an AEF flight commander at the University of uh, Wales Air Squadron at St. Athens. He flies the Grop Tutor down there once more. And uh, he joined the RF straight from school. So it's all he's known. That's uh, flying, flying, flying. And uh, he is leading the team out today. He's number two is uh, Pete Wells, and uh, Pete has been flying all his life as well, self-confessed air junkie, he's got over 6,000 hours, uh, a lot of time on tail draggers and that, which is unusual. He went solo on his 16th birthday, the number two pilot, so that was his 16th birthday, that's the absolute youngest you can go flying in. And uh, after trying a selection in the Royal Air Force, Pete specialized as an aircraft engineer and he now owns an, and is director of what's called Zulu uh, Gas Tech uh, Limited. It's a composite aircraft maintenance and sales company based down in Oxfordshire. Number three is uh, Barry Gwyneth, and Barry is an experienced GA pilot, so general aviation pilot. Here we are, not, not trained by the military. Uh, he had a PPL for over 36 years, and he's got about 2,500 hours, an experienced display pilot. Uh, he flew in Team Osprey, displaying his Yak-52s. That was my uh, aircraft of choice when I was flying, and uh, a great aircraft it is to learn aerobatics as well. Also, number two, a uh, number three slot, Barry is now in his ninth season with Team Raven, and he was one of the original founders and uh, a very accomplished pilot. Number four is uh, Gerard Williams. Now, Gerard was originally a professional rugby player in Wales. He also played in New Zealand and South Africa, and now he's got a successful business in the Swansea area. Again, a PPL, so not military trained. He 25 years experience and over 2,000 hours. And uh, he's one of the most experienced military jet pilots on the civilian list. So here they come, running in from the right. Now watch as the aircraft pitch up. The aircraft are flying, the OV-8s are a kit-built aircraft. So they're all pretty much specialized, and as you can see, straight up into what we call the Delta Loop. And these aircraft, although they look very similar from the interior, there is some subtle differences inside, especially with the avionics layouts. Uh, but basically, they'll have the same power plant, like homing, and uh, with some little fiddles inside. So they basically build it the way they want it. And uh, now watch as they come back from the 45, they're going to do what's called a Delta Underside Pass. Now, like the red arrows, they'll stick together for some of the display, but then they'll break off and you'll have what's called a synchro pair doing their specialized. So back in at the 45 degrees, crowd center. You see what I mean by that smoke? Now you can see how the smoke has been blown on that, on towards the crowd line. It'll be the same for the aircraft. So they're fighting that on crowd wind. And a very nice underside pass. Now four and five are going to break out. There they go. So uh, we'll introduce number four, which I said is Jared Williams. He's the uh, ex-rugby player. Number five is Russ Eatwell. And Russ is uh, on his second season with the team. to an offset loop. Great flying. Look at that, they're like mirror images of each other. This is where the smoke comes in handy, not just for us to be able to see, but they can see each other as well. So when you have a pair like that and they're doing some uh, formation flying, being able to see where your uh, partner is is obviously vital. So uh, the smoke, while it's good for us, it's also good for the team. Now coming in from the right, the rest of the pair. So the Raven teams, one, three, and six. Up into the top, into a barrel roll. Very nice, tight diamond formation. It's hard to believe it, but the pilot, who's, so the lead pilot in the lead is flying his routine, and on the right and the left of him, the trading pilots, they're actually looking mainly at where the team leader is going. So uh, wherever he goes, the rest of them go. So back come number four and five. Rolling up over the top. Another barrel roll. And 
Rossi, well at the back there, tucked right underneath Gerard. Now he changes position as he comes out of that loop. And look to your left. Here come the rest of the team. Rolling around a barrel roll. While in Vic formation, number two is barrel rolling around in a maneuver they call the cyclone. So watch now as teams, members four and five, they're gonna chase down that main formation and rejoin into delta formation. And then they'll come back in on what we call the B axis for what's called the three, two, one break. Good photo opportunity coming up. So the aircraft, as I said, is uh, basically a kit aircraft, or V8, and you can build them to your specifications, but it's a very, very good touring aircraft, uh, two-seater. You can uh, cruise along very happily at 120, 140 knots, and uh, it's got a very decent range. So the aircraft all back now in formation. So as I said, get ready for the three, two, one break. And it's gonna become obvious why it's called that in a minute. So look, get your cameras ready. So they pitch the aircraft up. Three, two, one, and there's your break. So four and five were broken out there, the formation onto the 90, and a vertical roll away for what we're gonna see is half Cubans, opposition half Cubans from them. And then get ready for the close pass. Ooh, that is close. Now max weight turn out and heading away. So keep your eye out because coming back in, number six is gonna perform a stall turn. And at the controls of number six is uh, Mark Southern. And uh, Mark, very accomplished pilot, as most of them are. By trade, he's an airline pilot. He's got 30 years flying Boeing and Airbus. So look to your left, coming back in on the 45. Lights on to help us identify them. Up into the vertical. Very nice, just keeping that so tight. Look at it, it's like they're moving as one. Incredible airmanship. Okay, so uh, as they move away to the right, we're gonna see uh, four and five come back. And they're going up into the vertical, into a cassette loop. As I said, these are the only civilian uh, aerobatic team left now uh, in the UK for fixed wing. Obviously, we've got the gazelles doing the helicopter. That is a civilian team as well. So now look straight ahead in the crowd center. Get ready for a cross break. There they go. Filling up the sky. Coming from your left, four, it's been chased hard behind it is number five. So Gerard Williams leading that two ship with Russi well behind. And both of them doing 
half Cuban and out the other end. In like a mirror formation. So you can see the main ship, three's way off in the distance, straight ahead of us in crowd center. Four and five, they're keeping their smoke on so the other team members can keep up with them. That'll help them to join up. So watch now as they trade off that height that they had for speed. They're coming straight at us. And then break, break, break. Out to the right again. The smoke aiding four and five as they come back in in a pair. Again, you see how they've slightly adjusted for the wind, they're slightly off center. Normally they come straight at you, but they've got like a 10 degree and up into the top. Now, I don't know how well this is gonna work in this weather because of the high winds, but this is your classic aerobatic heart. I don't know how long it's going to last up there with that wind. And there you go. Russ and Gerald doing a great job painting a heart in the sky. So four and five will break off to the right. Look to your right now. Here come the rest of the team. One, three, all the way through as they pull up into what's called a caterpillar loop. So, pitching down, the wind blowing them, making it a little bit more difficult than they want it, but perfect. Look at that, you see the gaps between the aircraft, exactly the same as when they went in to the maneuver, coming out at the other end. Now watch as all six Ravens reform into echelon left. They're going to be climbing into the crowd center with the smoke coming on as they perform their signature maneuver. And it's called the Twizzles. So it'll be pretty obvious why the Twizzles as each aircraft roll through the inverted and then they'll exit out on 45. So get your cameras ready. This is their uh, signature maneuver. So yeah, there's a very big uh, Orviate, or Vans as it calls, who's a manufacturer's uh, community. Uh, well, a good friend of mine up here, Derek, who's got his own van, v 8 Flies it a lot, it's a very popular aircraft. Easy to maintain with that Lycoming engine. It's like the Ford engine of flying. So there they go. Get your cameras ready. In echelon left formation. Smoke on, and time to twizzle. As you can see, they're all exiting out on the 45. They'll rejoin now in Delta, and uh, the team will then descend, and they're gonna pitch up into uh, Delta Quarter Clover for their final downward uh, display and it really is a good camera shot. It's what's called the downward bomb burst break. So it's exactly like it says. They'll all pitch the aircraft down and then they'll all split up. It's like a, a flower opening. So they're gonna climb up to height. They're gonna trade that height for speed when they come back. First of all, they'll all join up in delta formation as they come in from a right-hand side. So camera's ready for their last major maneuver. And what an opening for the uh, show. The International Air Show Festival of Flight 2023, Team Raven. With the downward bomb burst break. Perfection. 
Perfect. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for our visitors from, from Wales. Fantastic opening for uh, all of the team. So we've got to say a big thanks to uh, Simon Shirley, Pete Wells, uh, Barry Gwyneth and Gerald Williams, Ross Eatwell and Mark Southern. Uh, they've done us proud. And they're going to head back uh, and get some fuel before the next uh, act takes up our space. So now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, a couple of months ago, I was asked, uh, OK, we're going to be doing uh, the show in uh, up in Scotland and uh, part of the show is about STEM and STEAM. So I've been thinking about this for many, many years. I'm an air show commentator with 30 years experience and uh, I've been lucky enough to work with some amazing pilots and it's taken me 30 years to get to the level where I can pretty much look at something and go, oh, well, okay, that's a Strike Master, it's a Mike 48 or I can tell the difference between a Mark 9 Spitfire and a and a Mark 14, you know, it's very sad, I know, but um, I'm also a trained broadcaster. I used to do breakfast shows and radio. So I have this mixture of uh, media training and aviation training. But that's all about the change. For the first time ever in the world, not just in the UK, you are gonna hear an AI, artificial intelligence, doing an air show commentary. Uh, I've joined together with ChatGPT, which I'm sure you know about on, on the line, on the web, and uh, a company in Ukraine, in Kiev, and uh, we have uh, made a commentary for the next act, the Skymaster team. I'll tell you how it worked. I went into ChatGPT, I typed in uh, a one line, give me 2,000 words on the BAE Strikemaster history of that aircraft, and it came back with this script. And as I said, in 30 years, I, it would have normally taken me like a day to go through some articles, find this, find that, and it just printed this perfect 2,000 word history of the aircraft. So then we took that script and we sent it to Ukraine, to the guys in Kiev, and um, they very kindly had uh, with their help, we've converted that text into um, a voice that you're about to hear. And the voice is not uh, generated by um, you know, somebody recording it, it's actually an AI voice. So it's a completely synthetic voice. Um, the guys there, they um, work with Hollywood, they did the Star Wars uh, series, they um, have worked with Paramount, with Disney, so uh, they're very serious. Uh, players and uh, they've really done it done us proud they have um, so we're going to get that up and when the aircraft comes in to display I'm going to hand over to the AI and the AI is actually going to be doing the, the commentary so uh, the company that I've worked with is uh, Respeech and it's an AI voice technology that allows you to speak in another person's voice and they said Joe do you want a 12 year old girl doing the commentary do you want uh, your granddad doing the commentary, anybody could have done it. So we picked a sort of neutral voice um, and uh, they'll be doing it. So let's see when the Strike Master turns up. I'm going to hand over for the first time ever in the world uh, to an AI commentator. And he's going to take you through um, exactly what the aircraft is, its history, its development, and uh, how it was used. So this is a world first. So Ian Brett at the controls of uh, the Strike Master, and uh, he'll be coming from the north. So that's to our right-hand side. And uh, normally is now the time I'll be telling you about Strike Master and what it does, but no, we're, we're saving that for the AI to do. So uh, again, remember when you hear this voice, it's not somebody's voice; it's a computer-generated voice, and uh, it just read the script that the AI. ChatGPT generated. So here he comes from the right, ladies and gentlemen, the BA Systems Strike Master with an AI commentator.
training and light attack aircraft that has played a significant role in military aviation since its inception. Developed by BAC, British Aircraft Corporation, the Strike Master was based on the Jet Provost, a successful jet trainer. Over the years, the aircraft found its way into the hands of various military forces and private operators worldwide. In this history of the Strike Master, we'll explore its origins, development, service, and impact on the aviation industry. Origins and development. The Strike Master traces its roots back to the Jet Provost, a British jet trainer introduced in the late 1950s. The Jet Provost served as the Royal Air Force's primary jet trainer for many years, but by the 1960s, it was apparent that the aircraft needed an upgrade to remain effective in the evolving military landscape. In response, BAC initiated a development program to create an improved version of the Jet Provost. The goal was to produce a more potent platform capable of not only training pilots, but also fulfilling light attack roles in support of ground forces. The initial design retained many features of the Jet Provost, including its tandem seating configuration and straight wings. However, numerous enhancements were introduced, including more powerful Rolls-Royce Viper engines and the capability to carry a variety of munitions, such as rockets, bombs and machine guns. Introduction to service. The first prototype of the Strike Master, known as the Jet Provost TNK-5A, made its maiden flight in 1967. This prototype showcased the aircraft's enhanced capabilities and was well received by both military and export customers. Subsequently, the aircraft entered production, with the MK-80 and MK-81 models initially being delivered to the Royal Saudi Air Force RSA Air Force Kuwait Air Force. The Strike Master soon proved itself as a versatile and reliable aircraft. It was particularly adept at counterinsurgency operations, close air support, and training. The combination of training capabilities and light attack capabilities made the Strike Master an attractive option for air forces in various countries. Global service and upgrades. Throughout the 1970s and 1980s, the Strike Master saw widespread service across the globe. Countries like Oman, Yemen, Ecuador, New Zealand, Singapore, and Zimbabwe, among others, acquired the aircraft to bolster their military capabilities. Many of these countries employed the Strike Master in active combat roles, participating in regional conflicts and supporting ground forces. And there you go, ladies and gentlemen, that is the first AI commenting on an aircraft at an air show anywhere in the world. I would be very interested to know what you think of that. Would you rather listen to that guy? He's obviously in his mid-twenties, comes from Surrey, I would think, with that accent. But it's not. He's completely computer-generated. And uh, I have to say a huge thanks to the guys uh, in Ukraine, in Kiev, uh, Rustem and his team uh, from ReSpeech. Uh, they made an absolute amazing uh, copy of that. And the text, everything in there, this aircraft was operated by the Omani Air Force, and uh, it's a direct descendant. It's the content from ChatGPT could not have been more accurate. So uh, that is the future. That's what STEM is about. And do go over to the STEM village and uh, have a chat with them. Uh, I'm thankful that uh, I got Dr. Jeff next to me. He's the STEM expert. What did you think of that? The first AI air show commentary. Well, I think the, I think the problem is, Joe, you've done us out of a job. That's it, exactly. We'll all be out of a job, so this make the most of it. I'm not going to be here in 10 years. The computers are taking over. So let's concentrate now on the aircraft that we've got. The uh, STEM uh, is going to take a little sidestep as we watch the Strike Master come back beautifully prepared. A very potent aircraft in its time, and as the AI was telling us, uh, it was a very successful export aircraft as well, so the mainly in the Middle East, also went down to New Zealand and uh, that side-by-side -side configuration made it an ideal um, attack aircraft, a light attack aircraft, so rockets, bombs uh, could be used to uh, strike ground targets, it had a decent range as well with the tip tanks on it and uh, it could loiter for a long, long time. Strike Master, one of the big successes, uh, first 
success of uh, jet exports that continues throughout the day. And uh, we're very glad to have it here today at uh, the Air Air Show, International Festival of Flight 2023. What a beautiful sight that is. So we're going to be moving on now. And uh, we're going to go from uh, one AI commentator to uh, another one because this man is a machine, he's a computer. As the Strike Master comes back in, watch uh, in the center, get your cameras ready. That uh, very distinctive smoke trail coming out of the Rolls-Royce Viper engine, which was uprated for this Mark 58. Nice crisp roll as well. Also in its role as uh, an advanced uh, jet trainer, uh, ideal position for the uh, pilot and the uh, trainee pilot because side by side is the way you want to be when you're teaching somebody how to fly these at fast speed. You want to be seeing where his hands are going. And uh, nowadays, of course, nearly all of the trainers are uh, tandem, so you're sitting behind them. But uh, back in the day, you wanted to be sitting beside people so you could see exactly what their settings are on their throttles and also what they're selecting on the panel. Maximum speed as approach now as he's coming in from the left for his final pass. So get your cameras ready. Ladies and gentlemen, the BAC Strike Master. So we had uh, one AI, as I said, commentator now, and now the next AI commentator, because this man is like a computer. He has all the information at his fingertips after 16 years in the Royal Air Force, nearly all of it with Chinooks. Uh, I'm very pleased to hand over to uh, their team commentator, uh, Ben Greet, and uh, he's going to talk you through uh, the next act we're coming up, which is fantastic. It's the Chinook. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, I, I am Flight Sergeant Ben Greek from RFA and Edim, and it's absolutely a pleasure to, to come and take for all you. Good afternoon, uh, it's an absolute pleasure to commentate for you today. I'm Flat Sun Ben Greek from Basingstoke near London. I can't uh, give you an AI commentary, but hopefully we've got a bit more banter. If you look to your front now, uh, you can see the distinct silhouette of the Chinook coming towards us. This aircraft uh, is a venerable aircraft uh, and a bit of a veteran clocking up 12,000 hours from Bournemouth Air Show last weekend. Also veterans and uh, a couple of legends are in the crowd today as well. We've got Bob Somerville and an old wing commander Andy Lawless as well. He's got a great story, if you want to ask him, about his modification he made to a Chinook after landing it on the water and both engines flaming out during the Falklands conflict in 1982. The aircraft is a Chinook Mark VI Alpha. There's three aircraft based at RF Adium. Uh, five, six and six alphas. The one uh, displaying for you today is the six alpha. The aircraft's flying at approximately 100 to 200 feet. This low level environment is one that Chinook crews are very familiar flying in and we do so around the UK very often. Please get your cameras ready. Uh, the aircraft will soon do a nose up which will be a great camera opportunity. So ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the Royal Air Force 2023 Chinook Display Team.
Having executed a uh, pedal turn, the aircraft will now go to crowd left to reposition, and it's a great opportunity for me to introduce this year's display captain, Flight Lieutenant Jim Hobkirk. We've been giving him a bit of mick uh, during the display season this year, so uh, we thought we'd give him a little bit of a compliment for this display. No, sorry, we couldn't think of anything. So uh, Flight Lieutenant Jim Hobkirk is a pilot at Odium. Uh, he's got about 8,000 hours, 3,000 of those uh, on the Chinook. He's one of our experienced uh, instructors, having flown on the Gazelle, the Wessex, and of course, the mighty Chinook. Jim positions the aircraft to come from crowd left to crowd right to initiate the first of our maneuvers, the roller coaster. The roller coaster is a sequence of nose up followed by nose down attitudes, and it throws the aircraft into some really unusual attitudes. Jim pitches the aircraft no more than 60 degrees nose up before pushing the cyclic forward to give you 60 degrees nose down using both the energy and 9,000 sharp horsepower from the aircraft to come into the second of the nose overs. As he throws approximately 13 tonne worth of aircraft into the second nose over, we understand that Jim is flying the aircraft visually and without the benefit of a head up display, he needs a left hand seat to read out the numbers to ensure that he stays within the limits. In the left hand seat today, we have Flight Lieutenant Ian Coops Cooper. Coops would like to say hello to Dave Curry, who's in the crowd today, and someone he uh, shared a room with in uh, Kinloss when he was on the Nimrod. As a was up in the Nimrod, uh, Coops then decided to re engage and become a pilot, joining 18 Squadron in 2018. Since joining the squadron, he's deployed on many operations in Mali and has also supported the RAF in Op Shader. Let's join Coops in the cockpit now as he passes Jim through the second of the nose overs. Point four to roll. Point three. Ready. Enter. Now. Ten. will now put the aircraft into the second of the pedal turns and this will give you a unique view of the top-down plan view of the aircraft. This is unique to the Chinook and unlike most tail roaster helicopters it ensures that all the power goes through both of the rotor discs. Jim will now take the aircraft from crowd left to crowd right executing a series of wing waggles. This is a great photo opportunity for all of you in the crowd. As we said before, the aircraft's first operation was the conflict's Falklands conflict in 1982, and since then, it has been on many conflicts around the world. Most recently, it supported our French colleagues in Africa and Op Newcomb. However, the aircraft is probably most remembered for its use as a flying hospital in Afghanistan. During that conflict, we executed maneuvers such as the nose down quick stop. The nose down quick stop was used if we saw troops on the ground last minute and brought the aircraft from around 120 knots to a standstill on a sixpence. The crew will now start a trawl from right to left. The ramp will come down and our crewman will come out to give you a big wave. Please wave back as he can see you. He has the best seat in the house. Operating the red hands today is Sergeant Steve Shaw. Steve comes from Derbyshire in the Peak District. He originally joined up as an armourer and serviced the RF Tornado Fleet before it was retired. He then decided to re-engage and become a crewman before joining the squadron in around 2017. It's also important to remember that as you see the aircraft displaying in front of you today, 
There is a team of engineers supporting the aircraft back at Blackpool Airport. The Jango team is supported by his highly experienced air team and ensure that the aircraft is fit to fly. Steve now runs to the front of the aircraft and you'll soon see the ramp go up before the aircraft enters the Gorney corkscrew. This manoeuvre was first created in Gorney Bakuf in Bosnia and it was used to clear the high-sided valleys and also created a morale-boosting spectacle for our troops on the ground. As Jim enters the top of the Gorney Creek corkscrew, he will now turn left and execute a 500 degree descending spiraling turn. The Chinook Force hold a 365, 24-7 national standby commitment. This means that we can help civil authorities anywhere within the UK to help with things like flood relief, we're also recently helping on a risk rescript for the COVID pandemic. Jim will now bring the aircraft towards the crowd for the run and break. Hopefully that'll bring the lovely sound of blade slap to Scotland. We'll now reposition the aircraft for the next of our manoeuvres. The aircraft is supported by a team back at Royal Air Force Stadium. It's important to note that the aircraft does not fly unless air traffickers, admins and ops staff also help us to fight and fly the aircraft throughout the world. In short order, we'll be de deploying to Eastern Europe to help our NATO partners in Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania. Jim will now conduct a quick stop. This will be done at low level and keeping the aircraft at 100 to 200 feet. He'll bring the aircraft from 120 feet to a standstill. Bring the nose up as he approaches crowd centre. You'll then bring the aircraft to face you. And as it comes to the conclusion of our display, watch as we flash the landing lamp. The crewman gives you a big wave. Please give a massive wave back to the Royal Air Force 2023 Chinook display team. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure for us to display for you at this beautiful seaside location. We'd like to thank you for your support and we'd also like to thank you for all of our people watching on the live stream as well, which includes Jim's wife, Sue. Please come visit us at the RAF Village where we have a stand there and also follow us on social media where we have a presence on Facebook and also Instagram. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Ben, and thanks for the whole team. Fantastic display. You always deliver, and not just troops and goods, but also a great flying display. See what I did there? That's your new strap line. Copyright that. Chinook, we always deliver. Uh, so do go and see the guys. They're over at the uh, RAF Village, which you can't miss because it's got a full life-size uh, replica of the Typhoon, which we'll be seeing display later on this afternoon. So uh, coming up next is uh, a very unique aircraft, the OV-10 Bronco, and uh, one of my favorite aircraft uh, for, uh, if I win the lottery, this is the one I'm gonna buy because it has clamshell doors on the back and you can put like your barbecue and, and like a mini fridge in there as well and bring about six people with you. It's twin turboprop, so it's the perfect uh, picnic aircraft as well. 
Uh, just to let you know, we've got a little slight change to the program. If you bought one of the programs uh, today, uh, we've swapped uh, some around. Uh, so we did have the auto gyro coming up uh, after the uh, Spitfire from the Battle of Britain Memorial flight. But that's going to be taken over now by the Red Devils parachute team. And they're going to swap. And uh, where the Red Devils were uh, down to be jumping a little bit later on, we're going to have the auto gyro. So uh, coming up next, look out for the uh, OV-10 Bronco. He'll be heading in very, very shortly. This aircraft is a, a unique aircraft, as I said. It was designed specifically for uh, COIN, uh, for counterinsurgency, or COIN, as it was called, back in the day. Um, served most of its uh, war in the Vietnam War, but also deployed successfully during the Gulf War. Uh, Gulf War One, that was, and uh, also throughout the Cold War. And you'll see a very distinct uh, shape, a T-tail at the back as well. So uh, the OV-10 will be along with us shortly, and that gives me some time to talk about some of the fantastic sponsors that we've had uh, to help us support this show. As I said, uh, South Ayrshire Council uh, doing their best to uh, provide this show for free. And imagine 120,000 people. Just think of the toilets that they've got to organize and uh, of all the uh, infrastructure, the parking, and, and all the rest of it. So without the sponsors, uh, giving us some help financially, it genuinely would not be possible to do this show. And uh, I was talking about uh, Ayrshire College. Uh, they're uh, doing a great job, but our main sponsor, uh, or one of our two main sponsors, Spirit Aero Systems, our main sponsor is uh, Ashley Limited. And uh, Ashley Limited are our local based main contractor. They cover a wide uh, range of construction projects, affordable housing, residential, education, healthcare, leisure. And uh, they're very proud of uh, not just uh, providing uh, opportunities for employment, but also for the supply chain opportunities for local businesses. And they have a, a strong apprenticeship and professional training programs as well. So training local people to, uh, to join with them as well. And they're delighted to be the main sponsors. It's a fantastic event. And uh, they realize the wealth of benefit it brings to the local area. Uh, if you want to know more about them, please have a look at their uh, website, Ashley Scotland. Make sure you get your copy of the program as well. Everything is in there. You'll be seeing interviews uh, from uh, the pilots and also a lot of the acts more in-depth than uh, I will be going as well. And uh, finally, I've got to say uh, the Royal Air Force Benevolent Fund. Great to see them here. Uh, they're our, our official charity for uh, the air show and uh, the work that they do supplying support for uh, families, uh, not just of uh, the ex-Air Force uh, people, but also their families and their dependents uh, from two to 103, I was told this morning, uh, is vital. So please uh, do give them their support if you, you see them down on the ground today. Uh, as I said, we're running a little bit ahead of schedule, so it's gonna be uh, about a five minute break before we go. Uh, on to the next. That gives me a little time to have a look at uh, some of the Instagrams that I've been sending. If you wanted to say hello uh, to uh, some people here, uh, it's Joe Airshow on Instagram. And I asked the question, is AI gonna take my job? Well, Dave Phillips has uh, sent me an Instagram. He said he reckoned the job, that uh, my job is safe. And uh, that's from Dave and we Robbie. Thanks you, Dave. If you put that down in writing, it would help. Also, uh, we've got Nicola Hudson. She's uh, come to say hello. She wants to say, can she say hello to Lewis, Harris, and Orla? And this is their first air show, and they are loving it. So uh, we might have another change now. So uh, good news, uh, because the Bronco is uh, coming in. It's arriving a little bit early, which is good for us. Uh, Nicholas, as I said, uh, wanted to say hello to Lewis, Harrison, Orla, and uh, they're enjoying the show. Uh, also, we've got uh, a hello from Noel Stafford. He wants to say a big hello to the Stafford family. They've come all the way down from uh, Aberdeen. Uh, Becky McCade, uh, she wants to say happy 29th birthday to Craig Warwick. Happy 9th birthday, mate. Good way to spend a birthday down at an air show. Uh, that's from Becky. And uh, I couldn't think of a better birthday present than uh, 
a day out at an air show. Just looking off to my left, amazing crowds here. And uh, we're glad you made it. So look to your left as well. You'll see that very distinctive shape of uh, an OV10 Bronco coming in from our left-hand side, rolling down. So the North American Rockwell OV10, Rockwell were the manufacturers. They've been swallowed up now as a lot of these specialist aviation companies have. I think it's part of Boeing now, if I rightly. And you can see that very distinctive paint scheme on the aircraft as well with the orange uh, tips on it. That is uh, a little nod to its later life. It served in the Luftwaffe as a target towing aircraft. So uh, those clamshell doors at the back were ideal. They could open it up and uh, extend out the target that people would come along and take shots at with their Mauser cannons. But uh, you don't want people taking shots at your aircraft, so you put big orange markers on it to make sure they're shooting at the target and not at you. As I said earlier, the, no the North American Rockwell OV-10 Bronco, it's a turboprop light attack and observation aircraft. Some say it was the CAA, uh, sorry, the, not CAA, the CIA that uh, developed it because they needed an aircraft that could fly over the jungles in Vietnam and just soak up uh, all the intelligence that it could. And uh, that was uh, its primary purpose there. It was also used as what's called a FAC, a forward air control. So uh, it would get up above the battlefield and uh, it would call out artillery and airstrikes as well. And because of its uh, high wing and uh, it has what's called a big core, so it's got a good loiter time, it could hang over the battlefield and it has amazing visibility as well. Uh, you have uh, two pilots on board, well one pilot and one observer in that role and they seat in tandem, uh, one slightly higher above at the back. But uh, it also went on to serve in Vietnam and uh, then into the Cold War before it ended its uh, operational uh, roles with uh, time in Desert Shield, which was Gulf War I. It's a big aircraft, over 40 feet wingspan and just over 44 foot uh, long. It's uh, high as well. When you get to see it on the ground, uh, because it was designed to operate from rough, unprepared strips, at the front uh, and also not go into uh, airfields so it could land in a field. It has a very sturdy uh, undercarriage system so it's quite high and uh, you, you want a big undercarriage as well because you don't you want a big gap between the propellers and uh, the ground when you come into land. So it's quite a high, uh, it's 15 foot in height, uh, it has a two Garrett T-76 turboprops on it and that's developing over 700 shaft horsepower as well. And there you go, you get to see that undercarriage I was talking about. You can see it's quite leggy, we call it, uh, an aircraft that has got big long legs like a model. But that's uh, to keep those uh, propeller tips out of digging into the dirt when you're landing uh, on the ground. Service ceiling up to 30,000 feet, so clearly it's uh, got a pressurized cabin or you can have an oxygen system on board. And uh, a very decent range of over 13,000 miles. Now the variant that we see here is what's called the German version, the OV-10B, and uh, it was produced in Germany, as I said, as a target tug. 18 of these aircraft were delivered in the early 70s, and uh, they basically had a big steel cable winch inside the fuselage, and uh, those ca rear cargo doors uh, were replaced with a big clear dome, and they just attached the target to it was like a big windsock you know when you go to an airfield and they've got that windsock think of it something like that and then they just extend that out about five to seven hundred meters away from the aircraft and uh, traditionally that was used as um, a target for cannon uh, not so much missiles or stuff like that so for air-to-air -air engagement uh, training and following a career spanning 20 years the Bronco was finally replaced uh, in the Luftwaffe by the Pilatus PC-9s and uh, they were sent to various museums and museums, but Tony De Brewer, who uh, is the owner of this aircraft, managed to get his hands on one. And uh, he is uh, the display pilot we're seeing here. He really is the driving force behind the Bronco demo team. Um, I've worked with Tony before out in the Middle East as well, where he did a tour with this aircraft and he tours it all around Europe and it's a little family. Like I said, when you see it up close, you realize how big it is inside. 
and he just packs everything into it, all his luggage, he had a barbecue in there, and I thought, wow, this is perfect, this is, this is the warbird to have, because you can literally put everything in it, bring your friends and family, and uh, off you go to an air show. He's been passionate about aviation, he says, since uh, early boyhood, and he's also a commercial pilot with uh, 5,000 flying hours to his credit, and uh, clearly loves displaying this aircraft, showing the airplane off to its best advantage and uh, its rugged stall performance. So a stall aircraft is short takeoff and landing. As I said, it was prepared for operating uh, out of uh, recognized airfields, so it would land in a field and uh, tight little spaces. With those turboprops, you can back it up to a wall and stand on the brakes. It doesn't take uh, a lot of uh, runway in front of you to get airborne, because the uh, high wing on it generates a lot of lift. It's got what's called a big cord, so the, uh, the distance between the front and the back training edge of the aircraft and the control surfaces and that generates a huge amount of, you can see there, that's a very big surface area for a wing. You know fighters, you'll see them nice and slim so that they can slip through the air. Well this aircraft was all about generating lift and also that's what gave it its uh, very extended range and loiter time as well because you could pull back on the power you didn't need that much power you weren't using that much fuel and you're still generating a lot of lift with that big thick wing uh, Dan Griffiths also flies this aircraft and uh, Dan um, I've been lucky to fly with a few times last time I went flying it was in TB7 Avenger and uh, Dan has flown, well, just too many aircraft. I don't know how many. He's a CA examiner as well. And then Tony's given us a wave as he comes through. This is his last pass. Fantastic shape. You can see that big glass cone at the back. So uh, a brilliant display from uh, Tony De Brewer, the OV-10 Bronco. And uh, really good to see that aircraft here back. Uh, in Scotland. Hope we see it again. Thanks, Tony. So uh, now, coming up, one of my highlights for uh, this weekend, it's the Battle of Britain and their Spitfire is going to be taking to the sky very shortly. You'll be able to hear the uh, beautiful sounds of the Merlin engine. So I have a sort of rule that, uh, especially when it comes to Mustangs and uh, Spitfires and Lancasters. I do not talk over them when they come past us because I love to just hear that Merlin. So Tony's climbing away with his gear down. Looks like he's doing a dirty pass. Oh, he's coming back. Excellent. Oh, we're getting a stall approach. So this is a stall approach where he's pitching the aircraft down. This is how he would land in an airfield like that. Maximum flaps. Look at the back of the wing. You can see that the flaps are down. So he's bringing the aircraft down and that would be a runway that he'd be able to plant that aircraft into. And that's what it was excelling at for that. Nice stall approach and then departure off. So a uh, really good display by Tony. And as I said earlier, in difficult conditions, because these winds are gusting on crowd, not ideal, but uh, definitely within limits. So uh, just been talking with Les, our flight display director, and he's uh, telling me we're going to be bringing in the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight Spitfire, uh, MK356. Uh, we'll be flying in very, very shortly. And as I said, I have a, a sort of rule. I do not talk over a Spitfire. That's like, uh, you know, not very nice. So uh, we'll see him coming in and hear that beautiful sound. I can see him way off in the distance in my 11 o'clock, moving from left to right. That beautiful Mitchell elliptical wing. And this aircraft, well, what can you say about it? It's, uh, it's iconic. It really is. It's uh, the aircraft that uh, saved the nation, saved the world, some would say. And uh, Orjay Mitchell's design is uh, recognized worldwide with that beautiful elliptical wing design married to another icon, the Merlin engine. Together, uh, they made the most potent aircraft that got developed through many, many iterations. Uh, once it went past 
the Mark 12, it was into the Griffin engine, but some consider the uh, Mark 9 the classic uh, Spitfire. And that's what we're going to see very, very shortly coming in here. The Battle of Britain Memorial Flight, obviously uh, a living, moving tribute to the men and women that served in the Royal Air Force in the Second World War. And their motto is, least we forget, and quite rightly, because um, this is where these aircraft belong. They operate out of Coningsby, and uh, they also have the Hurricane, and a few more Spitfires, and a Lancaster bomber as well. So look to your left. You can see him just coming along the headland. He's going to turn in, and here he comes. Ladies and gentlemen, from the Royal Air Force, Battle of Britain Memorial Flight, the Spitfire. I want to make a ringtone out of that noise. That would be the perfect ringtone for your phone. That coming in, it's absolutely gorgeous. So this aircraft uh, moving in from the right now, let's just listen again to this beautiful Merlin engine. So Spitfire MK356 was built at Castle Bromwich. It was allocated to the newly formed uh, 443 Hornet Squadron, which was uh, part of the Royal Canadian Air Force at uh, RAF Digby in uh, March of 44. In the 60 days around uh, D-Day, uh, this aircraft flew 60 operational sorties. It was damaged by uh, enemy fire on three occasions and suffered three wheels up landings. But again, due to the uh, fantastic engineering and skills of the Royal Air Force engineering teams, this aircraft continued to fight throughout the war. It's also a bit of a uh, film star because this aircraft was in the epic film Battle of Britain. In the movie it was a static airframe and then in uh, 1992 it underwent a complete restoration to what we see here today, the airworthy status and that uh, was begun by a team from St. Athens. And uh, air, the refurbishment took five years. It was completed in uh, 1997. And that was the first time it flew in 53 years. So in 97, it joined uh, the Battle of Britain uh, BBMF team and uh, it's now painted as you can see in a desert camouflage scheme to represent the Spitfire Mark 9 C uh, which was one of the uh, Mark 9 Spitfires operated by 92 Squadron alongside the units Marks 5 in Tunisia the earlier Marks of the Spitfire had canvas covered control surfaces, so the aileron and the elevator. And uh, the Mark 9, one of its major steps forward, it was a very simple modification, and some say um, should have been done right from the start. They covered the control surfaces with metal, and that made them more rigid, and that gave them a far better turning circle.
once had the pleasure of interviewing the uh, engineer to Douglas Bader, who was flying a Mark V uh, out down at Duxford, and he told me that it was Bader's idea to cover the uh, control surfaces with metal because they had Irish linen cover on them before, so when you were pulling hard on them, they'd deflect and bend a little. And it was his idea to put uh, metal over the control surfaces and give them a little more rigid uh, controlling. So that's the Spitfire heading out to the right now. Fantastic display. And uh, thank you very much for everybody from BBMF. And uh, as the saying goes on their uh, motto, least we forget. So now, in a change to advertised programs, I've always wanted to say that, uh, we will be now going, uh, instead of uh, people staying in the air, these people are going to come out of the air because it's the Red Devils uh, parachute display team. And they're going to be landing in the main square behind us, behind the commentary position. And I've been assured it's big enough. Uh, they have a team commentator with them as well. They're going to come down. And we're going to have a chat with them in a minute. Um, now, I actually have done a parachute jump with two para, and this is true, down in Aldershot with the Red Devils, out of the Red Devils, uh, there was an Islander then they had, I don't know if they got that. And they do this training where they teach you for a day uh, to jump out and then you make yourself like a starfish, you put your hands and your arms out and you shout 1001, 1002, 1003, 1000, check canopy, and then you're meant to look up and see that the canopy is open, it's what's called a static line jump, so the parachute pulls itself. Ladies and gentlemen, I can tell you unequivocally that the words that come out of your mouth when you throw yourself out of an airplane are not 1001, 1002, 1003, check canopy. There was a complete other set of words that left my mouth as I exited from that aircraft. Now, I'm glad I did it, but would I do it again? No, I don't think so. But uh, hats off to these guys because they do it day in, day out, throwing themselves out of aircraft at great height for our entertainment. But remember, it's a skill that has... Uh, a purpose and uh, the two para in particular and the parachute regiment uh, have a uh, fantastic reputation worldwide as the elite of the elite and uh, it's great to see them here they're in the overhead and uh, the commentator will be along soon and we will be talking to him about uh, what it takes to uh, become a parachutist with uh, parachute regiment now the wind, as I said, it's an on-crowd wind, so it's blowing off the sea. It's not ideal, but they'll be compensating for that. And what they'll do first is they'll come through the overhead uh, with the aircraft. That will give them an idea of the cloud-based height, and also they'll throw out what are called woodies. And the woodies are uh, wind directors, so it lets them look to see where this woody is falling and it tells them wh what's the wind doing. Because the wind down here, it may be blowing straight in your face. You go up 700, 1,000 feet, and the wind is blowing in a completely different direction, and it's also a lot faster or a lot slower. So the woodies give them all the information they need. So uh, right now I'm going to hand over to uh, the team commentator. Introduce yourself, tell us who you are. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this afternoon's display. Brought to you by the British Army's parachute display team, the Red Devils. My name is Private Hobbs, and my job to today is to talk you through today's display and hopefully give you a bit of background information about the Red Devils. So, Private Hobbs, tell us, what, uh, how many people are coming into the arena today? How many people are jumping? So we should have uh, nine, nine jumpers coming in today. So we have our, our team leader, um, he would be out first. So as you, as you said, uh, he's flying overhead now. They're coming in for what he called the Woody Run. Oh yeah, I can see them now. So they're coming in over the town. Yeah, so right? any, anybody who wants to see the plane, you can look over, over the big white marquee or, or the rest of the town. Look up, the plane's about 2,000 feet at the moment. And like you say, they're about to throw the, the Woodies out of the plane. Right, so 2,000 feet is not the ideal exit altitude, so once they come through there, they'll climb up to an exit altitude, point. and that is dependent, I suppose, on the cloud level. Yeah, so um, 2,000 feet is not ideal for exit, it's about as low as we will exit the plane, um, and that's only really for, for London when we get a, uh, an aircraft limit of 2,000 feet, um, but it's perfect for the, the woody run, so... We've got limits of how far away the woodies are allowed to fly before they hit the ground um, as, as an assessment of the wind. 
So like I said, I did uh, a parachute jump with two para and the Red Devils down in Aldershot a long time ago. And they had a, a twin engine Islander then, but that's clearly not an Islander. What aircraft are you using these days? No, we've got a, uh, a Cessna caravan at the moment. Uh, so it's a regular skydiving plane. It's a single, single propeller on the front. Uh, pretty much a caravan with some wings glued to it. Yeah, they're great. They're very sturdy, these aircraft. Big turboprop engine on them. Uh, very, very popular because uh, they have a cavernous door. They have a nice big exit door that makes it easier for them to uh, do. And also, as you can see, very good slow speed characteristics as well. Yeah, if anyone's got a keen eye, they might be able to see on the back right of the aircraft. They'll have the door open now. Uh, two or three of them might have their heads poking out the door. There you go. You can see the woodies just thrown out. So, very technical piece of equipment, those woodies. They're long rolled up pieces of paper, effectively. A uh, bit of plasticine in the middle to give it some weight, and then uh, just chuck them out the plane and see how far they, how far they fly before they hit the ground. And is it true that two para give a thousand pounds to everybody that finds the woodies on the ground? Is it in cash? Yeah, I believe two para might. We don't. Oh, right. <laughs> okay, just wondering, because uh, a lot of people do find these now and again. And uh, I work with the Falcons, the the RAF team, and they're always saying, "Please, can we have a woodies back?" And I'm going, "Can't you just make a few more?" <laughs> yeah, I mean, we we've got loads of woodies. Uh, yeah, we're not giving out any uh, bonuses to anyone that catches them. But uh, yeah, they are just uh, biodegradable, so. Um, feel free to leave me. So that gives, uh, seriously, the uh, load, is it not the load master, the jump master? The yeah, jump the jump master, master up in the plane. Uh, he, he'll be flying around now with his head out the window, watching those woodies all the way down, seeing how they get affected at different heights. And also see. looking at the smoke that's just been generated in the arena. Yes, yeah, so we've got smoke for the ground winds. Uh, he's got his just assessments of how it's getting blown at different, like, how high it's flying, how flat to the floor it is, all of those things give him an assessment of what the winds are doing on the ground and how he needs to set up for his final turn and how, how far back or anything he needs to turn. Okay, and as you can see now, the uh, caravan has climbed up the height. It's a, a good aircraft for this. It's got a very, very powerful turboprop engine on it that uh, pulls it up at a fair old rate. You can see that pitch angle is increasing, but uh, I think he'll probably do one more rotation before he gets to cloud height. Yeah, so for displays we won't really go above cloud height because obviously if we're above the clouds you're not going to see us down here on the floor. Um, but we will fly up to 13,000 feet for jumps, uh, for training jumps. That gives us about a minute of free fall. Um, tandems, if anyone's interested in coming for us, we, we do up to 13,500 feet. We'll sometimes go up to 15,000 feet if the weather's um, ideal. But for displays, we rarely go above 10,000. So you can do a tandem jump with the Red Devils. How do yeah, you do so that? For charity, obviously, or something like that. No, it doesn't have to be for charity. We do also offer charity packages with us. Um, if anyone's interested in going for a, a tandem skydive with us, um, head over to our marquee, which will be by this bus here where I'm stood on the west side of the landing area. Um, come and speak to one of the team members over here. After the, d the display today, we'll have some VR headsets with us. So if any kids are interested in watching a free fall event from our side of things, so they can put the VR headsets on and watch our, our footage from the display. All right, that sounds like a good idea. My wife's here today, so if you're listening to that, Andrea, then uh, get in touch with them. I'll be, uh, it's Christmas coming up. You were scratching your head what I wanted. There you go. There you go, you can kick her out of plane. Exactly. No, for me, not for her. <laughs> she can get her own parachute jump. So yeah, it's looking good for the height now. You're up at least 4,000 there, four or 5,000, I'd say. Yeah, so they finished circling, watching those woodies now. They stay at about 2,000 feet until the woodies hit the floor. And then, yeah, they're going to build on their way up to cloud base now. Not sure what height the cloud base is at. I think the Chinook pilot said it was about 3,500 feet. So we've got a pretty low show if that's the case still. Now, when I did my jump, I jumped out and it was this like the classic parachute, the dome parachute. So I had no control over it. I was just sort of dribbling with the wind. The parachute you're using today, totally different. You, you ram air canopies, is that the right term? Yeah, that's, that's correct. Uh, so yeah, the, the, the parachutes the army use for things like the parachute um, insurgents, battles, anything like that, that's all uh, what we call rounds. So a circular canopy, you can't really steer them. The, the French version, you can steer a little bit. But these are they're basically like a flying wing. So they're actually two uh, levels on top of each other with tunnels running through the middle. And it gives them great control. They pull the, the control 
arm, you'll see the uh, the pilots, uh, the pilots, the parachutes reach up and pull down on these cords. They're called risers. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. completely correct. Uh, so yeah, the front risers give you speed, the rear risers give you lift, and the brakes just slow you down effectively. Um, so you turn with the, r the front risers on for that final uh, final turn coming in for landing, gives them loads of speed so that the brakes will uh, get, be more effective as they come into land. And hopefully today they'll have a nice quick landing for us. What sort of speed are they going to hit when they're jumping out before they deploy the chute? So um, in free fall they'll fill up to 120 miles an hour, which wow. is what you can experience on a tandem if you decide to come with us. Um, once they're under canopy, the swoopers on the, the faster canopies that will be down first, they'll fly up to 60 miles an hour coming into landing. On a, on a no wind day, they'll, uh, they'll probably use about the whole area. It's uh, a little bit of a misconception, but the parachutes actually do like a little bit of wind. You don't want it calm because you want some wind to fly into, don't you? Yeah, so the wind slows us down, which helps with the landing, obviously. If it's, if it's on the limits with the winds, you pretty much stand still once you've landed. But if, you, if you've got no wind, you're sliding it in and running it off. And it's, it's, yeah, it's, I'd much rather have five knots than, yeah. than nothing. So I'm pretty confident now that they're going to jump in this pass here. That looks pretty much where they want to be. And uh, they're slowing down and angling in as well. So uh, I'm going to leave the rest of the commentary to you. Yeah, hopefully there's a jump run coming in now, otherwise I've got a lot more still to do. So if anybody sees it before I do, um, keep an eye out for some red smoke trailing out the back of the aircraft. Don't worry, the aircraft isn't going down. That's uh, our jump master sticking his head out the plane, deciding he's going to go. He's popped a red smoke. Well, when, when you see the red smoke, that's him popping a red smoke. Um, giving us an indication down here on the ground that he's about to get out. There you go. I can see the trail now, if anyone else can see it. So he's now holding onto the outside of the plane, looking down, waiting until he's directly over that cross in the middle, and then he's going to get off. I think there might be a couple of them getting out this time. And then after them, you'll have our crew or other canopies getting out behind them. There you go, that's the first jumper out now. That'll be our team leader today. Today our team leader is Corporal Mike French. He's going to go into free fall. He's going to pull nice and low for us. He's going to pull at about 2,000, 3,000 feet. Deploying his canopy, hopefully any second. There you go. You see his canopy. So he's on a nice small canopy. He'll land nice and quickly for us. And then further up, we've got some more jumpers doing other things in the sky. Four jumpers right at the top. And hopefully we've got some flag jumpers up there as well today. So all members of the team then originally came from one of the four, re three regular parachute regiment battalions or the one reserve battalion that we have. All members of the team have initially served at least three years in the parachute regiment and ideally have completed at least one operational tour. From there they're allowed to come along to one of our selection weeks. So they spend a week meeting the team getting to know all the jobs that we do within the team and from there they can decide whether they want to come along to the team and the team gets to decide whether they're the right applicant for the team. So if you look right up the, up the top then you can see three canopies that have, have crashed into each other effectively. So this is intentional, don't worry. So they're, well, they're doing what we call crew, so canopy relative work. So they're going to hook up at the waist and connect the canopies together so they can fight the, can fight the canopies each. And there you go, they're doing it now. So they're doing a what we call a down plane. So three people hooked up at the waist. And there's first person down today, our team leader, Corporal Mike French. Setting the landing pattern for everybody else. Everybody now knows which, which pattern to follow, where to do their last turns, which directions to come, and they gauge off him as how strongly the winds are as well. Next down then, we have flying the Union Jack flag for us today. We have Lance Corporal Louis Cuddy. Coming down behind Louis then, we have flying the parachute regiment flag for us today. We have Private Max Hawk. 
Here you can see at the top, then again, those three canopies still attached together, making one big wing with the three canopies. Then you've got our cameraman flying behind them, filming everything they're doing, getting right up in that smoke for them. They're going to fly now over the top of the arena and down plane straight over the middle. They're going to reach speeds of up to 60 miles an hour in this down plane. And there you go, they've split nice and low for us there. They're now going to all try and turn and land at the same time for us. So landing first we have today our stack pilot, Lance Corporal Cameron Clark. On the left we have Corporal Henry Mole. And coming in behind them, we have a team sergeant, Sergeant Nathan Fisher. Coming down behind them, we have the team cameraman for today. We have Lance Corporal Ollie Goss. And then behind them, flying the Scottish flag for us, we have Lance Corporal Danny Watson. And last but not least, flying the army flag, we have Corporal Richard Kingston. There we go, everyone down safely for us today. So if anyone's got any good footage that they're posting to social media, please feel free to tag us on the Instagram with at Army Red Devils. We always love to see any footage or photos that anybody's taken of us. And like I say, if anyone's interested in, for, in coming for a tandem with us, find one of the members of the team after the after they've taken all their kit off and find one of the members of the team as they walk around the cloud, crowd, speak to one of the members about getting booked in for a tandem with us and we'll can see about signing up for them. It's quite far away for a tandem, we do them down in Wiltshire, which is down southwest of England, so I appreciate it's a long way to go. Well, a big thanks to uh, all of the uh, Red Devils. Great to see them as well. And uh, good to see you've got that Manchester United uh, logo going on there with the red, white and the black. And uh, my favourite team as well. So uh, they're all Manchester United supporters, are they? No, definitely not. All right, just checking. And uh, great display. Thank you very much. The team uh, are now going to start uh, bringing their uh, canopies in. They've got to check all the harnesses and everything like that before they uh, bring it all up. Are they going to form up in a line? Uh, no, I was told there wasn't a, wasn't right, a line Okay, today. cool. No lineup today. So then they'll be exiting out. That means we're going to be moving on very shortly. But uh, have you got a presence down on the ground as well? Is there an army uh, over? Because we know we've got the RAF village over there. Yeah, so I think there are army stands over in the RAF village. Um, the team will be walking around after the, dis the display. We also have a, a TV that we're going to set up with our, um, our team film from the last year. So all the footage of everything we did from the last year and t year or two. So you'll be able um, to meet the team members? Yes, yeah, so you can come around and meet the team members, get some photos with us. Uh, we've also got VR headsets, so if the kids want to watch, or parents as well, awesome. want to come and watch our perspective from one of the jumps, then they're welcome to come over and have a look through the VR headsets that we have. Okay, well, thanks very much, and thanks uh, again to the Red Devils and to the Parachute uh, Display Team, all of them. Fantastic job again. And finally, that orange smoke has dissipated a little bit. Why did you put an extra orange smoke down on the, on the beachfront there? So... Uh, um, we, ha we have to have smoke going throughout the whole of the display. Really? Uh, yeah, so the jumpers can see exactly what's going happening. If the winds change last minute, then they need to know about it as well. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's not toxic or anything, but we like to keep it away yeah, from no, people as obviously. much as possible. And it so. gives them a good idea. I think the pilots would like that as well, to be honest, when they're doing the display, because it gives them you know, current met on the ground, because met, as you know, is always, always changing. So uh, big thanks to uh, everybody from uh, the Red Devils. Great display, as always. Thank you again. Thank you for having us. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're going to move on now for uh, the next flying display. And uh, as I said, that was a change to uh, the um, uh, to the organised um, that we had in the main uh, program. So, can I have one more round of applause, please, for our uh, brave parachute regiment parachutists? Give them a round of applause. They've got their canopies up together, and. Uh, as they've just said, they're going to be out amongst us, so head over towards the RAF village and you can come and meet the team there. But uh, a round of applause for a uh, fantastic display and everybody nailed it right in the middle uh, of the uh, exhibition area there. So as I said, we switched around a little bit there. We were going to have the autogyro, that's going to come along later. But uh, staying 
like a rock in the middle of the program. It's the Starlings that are coming up next. And uh, this is uh, a pure aerobatic display team. Uh, great aircraft as well. A cap. I haven't seen a cap flying in a long time. So uh, we'll be seeing both of these aircraft uh, right in front of us. Uh, flying very shortly, doing full display. It gives me a chance to go through the rest of the uh, program. After that, we're going to have the Auto Gyro and then the Sydney Charles display team and the Pyrotechnic team that we had last night. Amazing display as the sun had set. That will be just after four o'clock. Uh, we saw the helicopters earlier come in with the uh, Team Raven, uh, the Gazelle Formation helicopter team. They're going to come back just after 20 past four and uh, do their full display. And then uh, we're going back in time a little bit in aviation uh, lineage. We're going to have an SE-5 replica aircraft uh, take to the skies in front of us and uh, do a display. And then after that, we're very pleased to welcome uh, the Rolls-Royce Heritage aircraft in the shape of the Harvard and the Spitfire aircraft, another Spitfire. And uh, then the penultimate act before the final display will be the Royal Air Force Typhoon. And uh, he's down to come on station at 10 past 5 this afternoon. And then closing the show, and I think it's going to be their only show today, because I know that the other show that they were meant to be doing uh, down in Southport and the South Coast, that got cancelled because it's chucking it down rain down there. Um, so they've uh, shifted up early, is the, uh, of course, the Red Arrows. So the Red Arrows will be closing, and they're coming in at 17.25. That's 25 past 5 for everybody else. So uh, plenty to see and do as well on the ground. As you can see, it's uh, quite busy in the uh, arena area. The STEM shell is uh, going really well. I was told the STEM was nearly full this morning. And uh, also the carnival is in full effect. So uh, plenty to see. We're only halfway through the flying display. And uh, a big thanks to South Ayrshire Council for helping us put this magnificent display together. Gives me a chance as well to talk about the Royal Air Force Benevolent Fund. They are our official uh, charity. Please do uh, support them if you see them. Uh, their collections are around the site. Uh, I was talking to uh, Gavin Davey this morning, the area director for Scotland, and uh, he's telling me that uh, there's some uh, amazing work that they do. As I said, between the ages of two and 103, was uh, the age gap that he said that he, they'd helped personally. So uh, please do uh, contribute to the Royal Air Force Benevolent Fund when you get a chance. So keep an eye out and uh, I'll keep an ear out on the uh, frequency uh, with regards to uh, the next flying display. It'll be here very, very shortly. Hello everyone, if you've just tuned in, wondering what's going on, live broadcasting an air show from Air in Scotland. Nice to see a few Americans joining us, wondering where on earth we are. My name's Ian, I'm in the production trailer downstairs. Joe's been taking you through the uh, the flying and we'll be doing so when we get back underway with the Starlings. Uh, I can see them on the flight radar out to our south. In fact, they're not on flight radar at the moment, so they might just appear. So Adrian and Andy, who are on camera, are keeping an eye out. I, I can see Adrian's got a lovely view out there to our south. Big crowd here in air. Lovely to see so many people out and about at the show. 
been many years since we've made it to Scotland for an air show. And lovely to see a huge amount of interest in the event. Not least because it's gorgeous conditions here, so lovely weather conditions, really mild. Not as hot as the rest of the UK. I don't mind that. And looking like a good action-packed afternoon. I'll run you through quickly what we're expecting, but we'll quickly say if you're enjoying what you're seeing, do give the video a like and do subscribe to us, Planes TV here on YouTube. That uh, all helps, of course. So expecting um, Starlings shortly. It's Cap 232 and an extra. And we'll also have... Gosh, I'm trying to figure out the order here because things have been moved around, as uh, Jay was saying. We've got Airborne Pyrotechnics, the Auto Gyro, SE5 Replica, Rolls-Royce Heritage Pair, usually Spitfire Mustang, I think. RAF Typhoon and the Red Arrows closing out the show, so plenty more to come. And Andy's got a lovely view of the crowd there as well, so huge number of people. Gradually building the Red Arrows closing the show, and I dare say everybody will want to see that. If you're not familiar with Planes TV, we've been doing this for 34 years, producing videos of air shows. Business started by my dad is up on the roof, providing you with the televato shots of the uh, flying display and much of that back catalogue is available on our streaming service at watch.planestv.com that's a paid subscription service let me see if I can um, yeah, I, can't, I, won't, I probably won't show you any clips just now because the starlings are heading in any time but if you head to watch.planestv.com you should very quickly get an idea of the sorts of content that's available on that service. Some real nostalgic air show action from the 90s. Bits and pieces of America, American shows, actually. We did a couple of seasons out there. Plenty of European action. Much of which, well, some more of which we'll be presenting to you next week. We're down in Jersey on Thursday. We're in uh, Czechia for the NATO Day show over the weekend, which will be out for us over their own YouTube channel. Andy and I heading out there. And then we'll also be over at Duxford, so a bit less European, but the Battle of Britain Air Show at IW, the Imperial War Museum, Duxford, near Cambridge. That production going out on our subscription service, that watch.planestv.com site that I was mentioning. Yeah, it costs £10 a month, but uh, hopefully worthwhile. Lots of action on there at the moment. And um, from our busy summer season, uh, Royal International Air Set 2 back in July one of the uh, particular highlights of the year so far but the, the Battle of Britain Air Show really should be a very well supported one. Duxford are uh, uh, celebrating their 50th display season so 50 years of air shows at Duxford and I'm pleased to say that Planes TV has covered every single one of those fine displays including the shorter flying days they're a couple of hours long um, we've done all of those free to view on YouTube we've done the main June show on that subscription service watch.planestv.com and we'll be doing the Battle of Britain Air Show on that service, and then we'll round off our season. In fact, the only thing I've got left in the calendar event-wise is the October flying finale at Duxford, and, and that, again, hoping that that one will be very well supported, with IWM marking their 50th display season. I've really been enjoying air. It's a lovely venue, especially in weather conditions like this. The flying uh, evening last night was just superb, the sun setting with Typhoon displaying and then airborne pyrotechnics as dusk set with their fireworks, wingtip fireworks and then we had a uh, balloon illumination, hot air balloon illuminated by its own uh, burner. Yeah, a real spectacle last night so it's lovely to see an air show back here in air and the guys have done an absolutely superb job. Very grateful for South Asia Council having us. Right, Jay's picked up the Starlings, so let's head over to him. In 2021, and they are former British aerobatic champions, Tom Castles and uh, Michael Picking. Both pilots have a combined aerobatic experience of over 50 years. And uh, we're going to see some pretty impressive maneuvers now because these aircraft, the extra and the cap that they're flying, they are built for one thing, one thing only, going really fast and turning really fast as well. They're pure aerobatic aircraft and uh, they are stressed to a lot of G as well. And the pilots at the controls, as I said, both of them former British aerobatic champions. Tom leading the pair, he's been uh, flying since 83. 
He's flown over 40 types of aircraft, 70, uh, sorry, 7,000 hours of experience, and that's a lot of flying. Uh, also did some parachute drop flying as well in the Islanders. Uh, very different aircraft, the Islander, from this one that he's flying now. And uh, he also flew the uh, Singsby Firefly. And he's had a lot of success in competitions, winning the Tiger Trophy. And uh, he acquired a Zlin as well, which was like a, a Czech-built uh, aerobatic aircraft back in 98. And with that, he won the uh, ISOR Trophy the same year. He placed third in nationals. And he's been on limited national champion three times. Uh, Michael Picking is uh, the other pilot behind him. Started flying at a very young age, been inspired by his dad. Uh, he won his first aerobatic championships at just 14, 14 years old. He won an aerobatic championship. It's unbelievable. He went on to become the youngest person ever to be awarded the CA display authorization for display flying. Um, at the age of 23, he became the youngest ever British advanced national aerobatic champion. And today, he is the youngest unlimited uh, level aerobatic pilot in the whole of Europe at 30. So he's a very accomplished young man and a bright future ahead. Michael has performed all over the world as a solo display pilot and also part of a formation aerobatic team, flying warbirds as well, which is uh, one of my great loves. Now the aircraft that we're seeing in front of us, one of them is the Extra NG, and the other one is the uh, Cap 232. Now the Extra, uh, Willy Extra, the German build, is uh, an amazing aircraft and uh, I've got some experience with the Extra 300 but this NG version is the latest and one of the most modern purpose design built aircraft for unlimited aerobatics uh, it, rising from the hugely successful stable of the Extra company as I said in Germany the original EA 300 was designed back in uh, 87 by Walter, Walter Extra he was a former German aerobatic winner and uh, the winning design has been tweaked and refined and improved over the last four decades. And it's just hugely popular. Wherever you go around the world, you'll find an extra flying. And uh, as we can see, they can stick together like glue. That's amazing when you can stick that close to uh, the pilot beside you. And it's, they're like one. It's like there's a, a sort of invisible chain that's uh, keeping them together. The other aircraft, the uh, Cap 232, is uh, designed in the late 80s, so it's, an, it's a later aircraft designed in France, and uh, in the Cap 30 family, they were very, very well respected, high performance aerobatic aircraft, and used by pilots across the globe for competitions and displays. This uh, aircraft was first flown back in 97, and like the Extra 300, it's just been developed a little bit more, a little bit more and uh, the aerodynamics and the stability have been added to throughout its uh, development career. It's also used by the French Air Force aerobatic teams and the Moroccan Air Force uh, display team. But when the aircraft is flying solo, you get to see the true capabilities of these aircraft, and we'll see that a little bit later when they break off and uh, are not flying so close to each other. Carbon fiber wings, of course, and uh, a 300 horsepower like homing flat six. So it's got the uh, ubiquitous Lycoming 540 engine. So it's a boxer engine. It's a flat six engine. Like uh, So the pistons are going left to right as opposed to going up and down. That helps with gyroscopic effect on the aircraft. And uh, you can see the control that they have. Even with this wind blowing it on, on crowd, they're still sticking the aircraft exactly where it needs to be. If you get a chance, you'll see there's little, uh, they look like uh, triangles hanging down underneath the aircraft. Now they're attached to the control surfaces, so the aileron and the elevator, and they're called spades. And uh, what it is, is think of a little triangle, okay, and it's in the wind, because these haven't got any hydraulics, so when you pull back like you do there to change direction and you do a wing over like that, pulling back on the control surfaces takes a lot of effort, but with these little spades hanging down in the air, they grab some of the air and they actually help you. Look at that roll rate, snap roll. 420 degrees a second these aircraft can roll. So the spades can actually help you control, uh, move the control surfaces a lot easier. 
now that they've split up we're going to see a little bit more of the aircraft's potential so now again up into a wing over boot full of rudder at the top of that and plant the engine down building up speed as they come through and uh, again we'll see some more of those uh, massive control surfaces so you know like when you get behind a Porsche, a big Porsche, like a turbo or something like that, it's got these massive fat tires. Well, the reason a Porsche or something, one of those Ferraris, have got big tires is because the engine generates so much power that when you put the power down, if you had skinny tires, the tires would just rotate on the ground and you wouldn't be able to grip it. Well, it's the same principle with these uh, control surfaces. They have massive ailerons. Because they've got so much power, the ailerons act like a tire on the ground, grabs the ground, but the ailerons on these big uh, ailerons on these aircraft uh, uh, grab the air, and that's what gives them those fantastic roll rate. So uh, that's why you'll see uh, these big, big ailerons and elevators on them. So 420 degrees second roll rate, so that is about one and a half rotations in one second, so we would literally like being inside uh, a spinning in fact, I think down at the uh, fun fair they've got something that rotates that way. So now watch another heart is coming into the skies above. So is that the festival of flight? Very nice. Dude. But you can see the wind, how quickly that has been blown away. The pilots themselves are sitting uh, slightly leaning back, uh, the aircraft seats about a 25 degree rake on them and that helps with the g-forces because the pilots themselves they're the ones that are going to suffer g-loss before the aircraft the aircraft was stressed well above 9g you can see with those snap rolls into the inverted so by laying back and laying your feet down that helps you conserve uh, some of the g-forces that are pushing down on your body when you're doing those snap rolls as well your neck is really getting the pounding as well so they really do train like athletes into the vertical, rolling into a launcher back, and then he was gonna, thought he was going to spin off the top there, but no, he's doing just rotating on the prop at the top. Now he's doing a tail slide, coming back, working the rudders to straighten the aircraft up, and then just powering down. They have a power to weight ratio close to one, so they can do vertical and just pull back and accelerate into the vertical as well. And watch now as he's rolling the aircraft and just a big boot full of rudder at the top of it, sliding off the top and then look at the power, just holding the aircraft up with the propeller, acting like a helicopter before he slides it back down. So as I said, the Cat 232 is the older of the aircraft and the uh, extra, the uh, NG version. Again, it's got uh, uh, light combing, but it's got an uprated one, whereas the cap's got a 540, this has got a, a 580 engine, and uh, the G limits on the aircraft are plus and minus 10. 10 Gs, it's just ridiculous. Uh, a roll rate of 400 degrees per second. Uh, they're not particularly fast, as in, um, you know, you can get turboprops aircraft that are gonna go faster, but it'll cruise along at about 230 miles an hour. They're not, again, they're not really made for, you know, going cross-country and taking your uh, family out for a picnic for the day. They really are stripped down inside. And uh, you, if you ever get a chance to get up a closer look at it, it's, uh, it's a form follows function design when you look inside of it. There's the bare minimum of uh, instrumentation as well because it's all about keeping the weight down and uh, keeping it as light, as nimble as possible. Again, boot full of rudder as he went into the vertical there, letting it slide in the inverted as well, doing that horrible, horrible negative G. So there's two types of G-forces. You've got the positive G, where you feel everything pushing down on you. Uh, but sometimes if you invert the aircraft and you push out, you get this uh, positive G. And it's the opposite. You're being sucked out of the canopy. You can feel that your harness is tightening because it seems that you're moving towards the canopy. It's a good way to find a pen if you drop it in the plane. Do some positive G because the pen will just pop up off the floor and it will be stuck on your canopy. But otherwise I wouldn't advise it. So the Starling team, as I said, uh, a pretty new team since uh, 21. So uh, doing a fantastic display for us. 
Tom gained his pilot's license, as I said, back in uh, 83. And uh, he's got the most experience. But Michael, as I said, at a very young age, he's what we'd call a prodigy. Now we'll get to see the extra into the vertical. Look at that, just flick rolling it at the top. Tumbling the aircraft down. That's a, a mixture of using the feet and the power of the aircraft. So he's trying to pull back to pull off the power while he's using his feet to move the rudder and also use the stick as well. Oh, again, outside. So that horrible positive G at the top of it. Just the power to weight ratio of these aircraft is phenomenal. To be able to see it flick around like that, and then within his own space, he's regained the control. He just punches forward with the power, and the aircraft immediately responds. So, flick rolls. And the Lycoming engine, like I said, it is the sort of standard for um, aerobatic aircraft. We saw them earlier with Team Raven. Uh, they were slightly smaller, I think they're uh, uh, 400s, uh, Lycoming 400s or 380s. But uh, this is the 580 version, so a lot more horsepower. So to put it in perspective with the power to weight ratio, on these, if you had uh, like a Ford Escort or something, this aircraft weighs about half the weight of your car and it's got maybe twice the power. So, and it's going through air. So you can uh, see how it's able to be able to maneuver so violently. Reverse roll and into the top as well. Again, pushing forward at the top. Like a bunt, we call that a bunt, where he's pushing the stick forward and uh, trying to get the nose over at the top and rolling all the way down. So you can imagine doing this is very, very disorientating and a lot of the display pilots frequently do a lot of flying off season because you have to keep that standard up. You have to keep the, the muscle memory and your body used to these G-forces coming up. Because if you were to say, okay, well, it's end of September now, I won't be flying again until January. Look at that side slip. Oh, oh look at the rudder at the back. You can see the rudder was in full deflection there, so he was sliding the aircraft forward in front of us. So most display pilots, especially if you're doing warbirds or whatever, clearly you're not pulling these sort of Gs. But these guys are working throughout the year. So in the summertime, it's not unusual for them to go out to the south of France or Spain or somewhere like that with the aircraft, just to keep that uh, G tolerance in their bodies. And uh, they are true athletes from their head to their toe. They are just pushing their bodies through it constantly. So they're rejoining now as they're coming in from our left. So inverted as the team comes through. Great display, fantastic display. First time I've seen them display this year. So uh, Michael Picking and uh, Tom Callis, Team Starling. That is a lesson in control. Control of power, precision, and fantastic airmanship. So as uh, Starlings head off towards the airport, we're going to refuel, I'm sure, before uh, they head home. Uh, we switched things around earlier, and uh, in the program it says it's uh, the Red Devils, but clearly we had them before. So uh, that means it's the autogyro. Now, if we were lucky enough, if you were here last night, you would have seen the Calidus autogyro display. And uh, it's a pretty unique aircraft, this. It uh, has... Uh, everybody talking about it because of its uh, uniqueness. It's also, relatively speaking, a cheap form of aviation. Um, so you'll see it coming in shortly, and it looks like a helicopter crossed with a, uh, a plane, like a bug. 
So the rotor on the top is not actually connected to, it's obviously connected by a hub to the, to the airframe, but it's not connected to a power source. There's no power going to it. It's a freewheeling hub on the top of the aircraft. And as long as the aircraft is moving forward and there's air flowing through that disc, then you're going to generate lift. And you'll notice the disc as well is slightly tilted backwards. It's got about a 10 degree pitch on it um, as it comes in. And uh, that's because in level flight, you want the air to flow through it. And if the pitch of the disc was level, then clearly the air wouldn't go through it. So uh, the uh, Calidus Autogyro, which is its uh, full name, it's a non-aerobatic show, but he's going to push it right to the edge, but he doesn't flick roll it like we had before. And uh, the flight speeds in this display are going to hit a maximum speed of about 120 miles per hour, uh, but it'll also go into the hover, so down to zero. And it really is a unique uh, aircraft. I've got to mention some of the sponsors, uh, Pooley's Pilot Supplies and Runway HD Navigation Software uh, that help uh, the aircraft display. It's a tandem two-seater aircraft, and if you do get a chance to look at it online, inside it's really nice, it's very comfortable, it can do cross-country, it's... Uh, a lovely aircraft to fly and very safe because it's got that uh, rotating disc on the top. If any, let's say the engine goes bang and you've got to land, it's perfectly stable. You've still got the rotation of the disc on the top and you can pick a spot and just land like uh, a normal helicopter. In fact, the landing sequence and the emergency landing sequence are exactly the same practically, I've been told. So uh, yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful aircraft. It's uh, good for touring. It's got cabin heat, fully adjustable pilot seat. It was uh, certified by the CA back in January of 2011. And uh, over a thousand of these aircraft were sold worldwide. And uh, the demand continues. I think the reason is because it's got an enclosed canopy. Most auto gyros, it's like you're out in the elements. So if it's raining, you're gonna get wet. But this is, uh, I think it's one of only two or three on the market that's got a completely closed canopy. <coughs> so auto gyros, uh, the actual design themselves go way back, right uh, to the beginning of uh, flying. They were invented back in 1923, and that's only 20 years after uh, the Wright brothers took to the air. And uh, it was a marked departure from conventional fixed-wing aircraft. Basically, they were looking for something that could not stall, because stalling was the big problem. They uh, hadn't quite perfected the wing design, so you didn't have uh, movable flaps, and you couldn't make a wing bigger or smaller. Basically, the wing that they took off of was the wing that they were going to land in as well. So you always have that trade-off between, I want a small wing, I want a very small surface area when I'm going at high speeds, but then when I'm coming into land, and I'm slowing down, well, I want a big wing. Now I want a big wing because I want lots of lift and I want as much surface area as possible. So uh, until the invention of flaps, um, stalling was a very, very big problem, especially when you're coming into land. And the auto gyro took care of that. They're also known as gyrocopters or gyroplanes, or just gyros. And uh, they were the first road rearing aircraft to fly successfully under full control. So before helicopters came along, this was the first one. It was uh, copied by the helicopter designers, and then they thought, well, hang on a minute, if we can get this spinning thing to just uh, hook it up to an engine, then uh, it's a completely different flying machine. So as I said, once you see it come in, it all became clear, but there's a propeller right at the back of the aircraft, and its job, like most propellers, is to pull the aircraft and push it through uh, the air. And uh, as that pushes the aircraft forward, the rotor at the top, as I said, with that slight incline, starts to rotate, and that rotation just keeps on spinning, freewheeling around. 
So if you did stop the engine, the aircraft would just slow down a bit, but uh, with regards to descending, because you've still got that air flowing through the disc, even if you're going straight down, you've still got air coming up through it. Um, that gives you the lift and that gives you control. Just to give you an update on uh, what else is coming up this afternoon, after the auto gyro, we're going to have a pretty unique display, the Sydney Charles display team as it's called, or the pyrotechnic display team. We had them last night and it was a lot darker where they were letting off fireworks and uh, it was amazing, really, really cool. Um, the aircraft is covered in LEDs as well, so they're flying Crop 109s, uh, so they'll be coming in and doing a display just after 4 o'clock. Then the Gazelle formation is coming back from the airport at 20 past 4 this afternoon. And uh, the SE5, as I talked about earlier, it's a replica, and that's coming in uh, just after 4.30 this afternoon. Then the Rolls-Royce Heritage team are joining us in the shape of the Harvard and the Spitfire, and uh, they'll be taking us up to about 5 o'clock. After 5, the RAF Typhoon. Little word of warning, if you've got youngsters with you, it is very loud, especially in reheat, so warn them or cover their ears, but it is super loud. And that's at uh, about 10 past five. And then closing the show later this afternoon, about 25 past five, will be, of course, the Red Arrows. So uh, the best is yet to come, for sure. Lots going on as well on uh, Instagram. People have been uh, asking us to say hello. Richard Hurren uh, wants to say hello as well on there. And, uh, if you want to uh, reach out, by all means do. It's um, Joe Airshow on Instagram. He says he's loving the Airshow. He wants to give Rory a mention. He'll be 13 tomorrow. Well done, Rory. You can come back tomorrow. There's a car show on. And uh, they're right down in the front of the center line. And uh, he has said that's from love from his mom and dad, Grand and Papa. Uh, John has also uh, sent me a little note saying great show love the red devils first here shout out for all the rygate please great music and then what's that four beer icons lucky man uh, mark salisbury is here and uh, he wants to give a shout out for his boy sam and his best mate zach hope you're having a great day and uh, apparently he's enjoying the commentary are you at the right show are you sure okay uh, i've also got to say hello to shani and mark who are here this is pure abuse of my position as the commentator to my cousins. My wife's brought them down. So uh, nice to see them out of the house for a change and the bar. Jacob has uh, let us uh, know. Can you please say hi to uh, Jackie and Dennis Dunlop? And uh, also Chaz, great name there, Chaz. Uh, hi to Greg Rowley uh, at the show from, he's come all the way from Brendan in South Africa. Get away, that's pretty good. He's come from South Africa. Well done, Greg. Hope you're enjoying the show, mate. Uh, Angel, uh, sorry, Angie H. Uh, hello to their son, Callum, and his friend, Daniel, uh, on the photographic platform, and that's from mom and dad. If you want to say hello to uh, somebody, give me a shout on uh, Instagram at uh, Joe Airshow. I'll be happy to uh, get it out if we have time. And. Uh, Hopefully, uh, very shortly, we'll be having welcoming in the uh, next act, which will be the auto gyro. To, uh, Charles joining from Malta I see in the chat um, hello everybody if you're wondering whose voice this is it's Ian in the trailer Joe's doing the event commentary but I'm doing the uh, vision mixing down here with uh, the Plains TV team got Adrian on camera and Andy too thank you so much for tuning in we've got um, a couple more hours of where are we four o'clock now so yeah a couple more hours of uh, flying action to come including 
I'm expecting the auto gyro soon, as you've heard. Airborne Pyrotechnics too. The Gazelle Squadron, we saw them earlier with Team Raven, they'll display on their own. Then the SE5, Rolls Royce Heritage Pair. And I can see everyone in the chat getting excited about Blackjack Typhoon later on. And we'll be closing out with the Red Arrows. Lovely to see so many of you in the chat. Do give the video a like. And if you haven't already subscribed to Planes TV, now's a good time to do so. One more flying coming up next week. Thursday we'll be at Jersey. We'll be covering NATO Days in Czechia over Saturday and Sunday. That live broadcast out on the NATO Days YouTube channel. And we'll also be live broadcasting from Duxford. So that's it, that uh, going out on our streaming service at watch.planestv.com. If you're not familiar with that stream, streaming service, you can't have been watching earlier when I've been heavily plugging it far too much, but forgive me for doing so again. That streaming service uh, bringing you many of our live broadcasts, so Royal International Air Tattoo in July this year, for instance, but also our back catalogue of air show action stretching back to the 90s. So lots of stuff to check out on watch.planestv.com. Nice time to do so. You've got the uh, the uh, sort of last um, uh, premium live broadcast going out there, the Battle of Britain Air Show in September. So, Adrian and Andy reckon uh, the uh, gyro, the auto gyro is heading in soon. Really nice display, this one. Keeps it nice and low and quite close to the crowd. And lot, we'll get lots of waving, I'm sure. Lots of enthusiastic audience participation, which is always wonderful to see especially from such a large crowd, which we do have at air. Chance for me to say a big thank you to South Ayrshire Council for having us here. It's been a wonderful event, especially last night with the uh, beautiful sunset as a backdrop for the evening's flying display. So I don't have eyes on the uh, auto gyro yet, so I'll stay with you just for a moment more. Ian spotted a seagull. Yes, well, that's one of the occupational hazards here for our camera operators. Uh, we were waiting for the Bronco earlier and Adrian's and Andy said, oh, I thought I saw it, but it was a, a seagull. And Adrian said, yeah, I've seen 12 uh, Broncos so far and they've all been seagulls. When you are looking out to see, it's very hard to uh, judge the difference between a bird and a uh, flying participant coming in. I can see, I'm looking at flight radar as well to sort of keep an eye on what's going on. Can't see... Um, Peter Davis on there just yet. Nice jet ski on camera one that I've just missed. Excellent. So Andy spotted him. I'll hand you back over to Joe. Leaders away from us. And you see what I mean by that unique shape? Beautiful sound as well. And that rotating disc at the top, that's just spinning around. There's no petrol being expanded making that. And so it's the forward movement of the aircraft and the wind moving through it. That's generating all that lovely free lift at the top of the aircraft. Rotax engine powering the aircraft. They're pretty bulletproof Rotax. They go on and on, no problems. Easy to maintain as well. Uh, but as I was saying, uh, if you wanted to land in this aircraft with an engine failure, probably about a three meter landing roll, if that. It can land in its pretty much its own space. So they're very, very safe to put down anywhere safely. And uh, another characteristic of the aircraft, thankfully for today, it can easily handle strong and gusty winds, uh, capable of handling knots up to about 40 knots. So that's a, that's a pretty big wind. We were talking to the parachutists guys, they don't drop in anything uh, over 20. So uh, that gives you an idea of the wind it can handle. And for such a small aircraft, you think all oh, high winds are gonna be a problem. Well, it's the opposite. Uh, it sort of eats up the high winds and the rotor blade on the top will be just spinning even faster because of all that free wind coming through it. Sponsors, uh, we have to say thanks for uh, bringing the aircraft with us today. The Airbox Runway HD, it's a, a VFR, Visual Flight Rules uh, Navigation Software. And they're the makers of the best uh, VFR flight planning and navigation software in the world. And of course, Pulis flight equipment. Who doesn't know Pulis? If you're into flying, Pulis are the people to go to for all your maps, your slides, your shirts, key rings. Uh, what else do they do? A lot of stuff. Don't ever buy the Pulis catalog because you'll just end up buying everything in there. Uh, display routine. Well, as we can see, it's uh, changeable, up and close and personal. 
And uh, during this display, we're going to see low speed and low energy. It's clear to fly, as I said, 75 meters from the crowd. So uh, unlike a lot of display routines that flash past you, as you can see, this is very, very close and personal. A little bit later on in the display, uh, we'll see the pilot actually remove not one hand, but both hands. And he'll be waving at you as he comes through. And that shows the stability of the aircraft. Uh, I'm pretty sure he's keeping the control column between his knees to keep it going straight and forward. But uh, it's the only display aircraft that I know that where both hands come off the pilot and he's waving at you. Some people may recognize it from uh, the James Bond movie. Well, it wasn't this particular type of aircraft, but it was a version of it, Little Nelly. You remember that, the James Bond film. That's where it sort of came into uh, its first contact with the public. Later on, uh, when Peter has finished his routine, we get what's called a gyro bow to the crowd. That's when we know he's finished. But in the meantime, he's going to push it through the envelope. He has a, a very strange wish, Peter, uh, the pilot. He wants to be the first man ever to fly, to fly through the Channel Tunnel. So he wants to use this aircraft to go into the Channel Tunnel, because he reckons it's wide enough, and fly through it. Why? Why would you want to do that? That's just silly, Peter. But there you go. I suppose it's good to have goals. But that's a silly goal. He's been spaying the aircraft uh, not just in Europe and in the UK, but he's been all over the world. Um, I was working out in Dubai, Dubai Air Show, and we had him out there. He's also been as far down as New Zealand, Germany, Paris. He's on Farnborough, so uh, he truly is international. These aircraft are very popular as well uh, in America, seen as uh, sort of cross-country aircraft. As I said, this one is fully com fully laid out it's got heating because it can go up to 13,000 feet um, you don't want to go much further than that because obviously there's not much oxygen after 10,000 feet so if you were up there you'd have to bring some oxygen with you but uh, you can cruise along quite happily at a hundred miles an hour and uh, its rate of climb is up to 1200 feet per minute so it's got a very good climb rate for such a small aircraft. there you go waving both hands Hello, Peter. How are you? That's just weird. Both hands waving at you. You're not going to see that with any other aircraft here today, I guarantee you. Especially when the red arrows turn out. They're known for keeping both hands outside of uh, view on the controls. So uh, the aircraft, as I said, has a very decent uh, range. It uh, can carry up to 200 kilograms of personnel and luggage. And takeoff distance, well, depending on the wind, as little as 10 meters. So you can roll 10 meters and then it'll start to rotate. And again, depending on the wind, you can pretty much land on your own width. So, see how tight it'll turn? And remember, all the time that he's doing that and turning it, that rotor blade at the top is just eating up the energy and it turns. So, So, watch now as he comes and rotates around, heading back into crowd center. He's going to pitch the aircraft up. And this is his signature bow. A little dip of the nose. With the wind behind him. I don't think he was going to be going into full hover there because the wind behind him is going to be pushing him forward towards crowd center and then heading off towards the left. Has up to four hours endurance, so at 100 miles an hour, that means you can go 400 miles. And uh, he's gonna swing back in, I'm pretty sure, for one final pass. Quite a unique helicopter slash aircraft. 
slash gyrocopter. So he's waving the controls. Let's see if he's got both hands on there. Nope, there you go. He's waving again with his hands. Oh, somebody's given him a big orange hand by the looks of it. So he's, he's been learning from the chin-up guys because they had those massive orange hands. So he's got one as well. Good idea, Peter. He's uh, heading back now. And uh, that's it. He's uh, back to Presswick to uh, land. And uh, thank you very much for a fantastic display from the Auto Gyro. I've got to say, I do a lot of air shows. Um, but you guys are, without doubt, the most clappy crowd that I've ever been with. You're clapping at everything. And I really appreciate it because so many people, especially down south, do not clap because, no, we don't clap. That's not what we do. But come up here. You guys are so friendly. Thank you. It's, uh, it's great to see your appreciation of uh, the uh, air display. Long may it continue. So uh, now the Sydney Charles display team, or the pyrotechnic team as we were calling it last night because uh, the guys were letting fireworks off and all the rest of it. Really, really good display. So uh, they are flying Grop 109s and uh, it's a pretty unique aircraft. It's like a motorized glider. And they specifically asked, can we play some music while uh, they're displaying? Quite rightly so, I'll be happy to uh, play the music they've sent me, so uh, I'll be keeping quiet and we'll just sit back, relax and uh, watch the uh, Airborne Pyrotechnic teams, they're sponsored by Sydney Charles Aviation Insurance Services and it's a father and son team from a farm strip down in uh, Wiltshire, Tim Dews is the father, he grew up on Doxford uh, airfield flying models when his uh, father flew gliders all over England. And uh, at 16, he started his apprenticeship. And he repaired a Grob 109, which is the one that we're going to be seeing here, that had been written off in a storm, and he actually brought it back to life. And uh, he has three sons who grew up flying models with him before they could fly the real thing, and he taught them the basics of flying with that. And now Ben, his oldest son, uh, came with him to France in 2010 and picked up a damaged Grob 109 as well. And uh, they fixed that Grob, and that's the one they're flying today. And uh, Ben went solo on his 16th birthday, and uh, he did gliding. And gliding is a really good uh, entry into flying. If you're into flying, it can be expensive, clearly, but you should look at gliding. I know so many military pilots, display pilots, that started off their flying career by doing gliding, and it really does teach you the good basics. So as you can see, both of these father-son teams are uh, proficient at this. So I'll sit back, relax, we're going to play some music, and then we're going to just watch the Grob 109s from the uh, display team.
start up high and then they transition as they come down and are swapping that height for speed and that gives them the energy to get into uh, the maneuvers but uh, lovely piece of uh, flying display so coming up next we're going to go from uh, the gliders power gliders to rotary because it's uh, time for the gazelle formation we saw them earlier on coming in with uh, the guys from uh, Team Raven, but uh, now they're back on their own. And uh, as I said earlier, they are a civilian team. So uh, as Team Raven are as well, they are uh, the only, uh, I think they're the only uh, civilian team that are operating helicopters. I'm pretty sure that is uh, the case. So we'll be seeing them coming very, very shortly. now retired from uh, service and you can see them way out in the distance there moving from left to right by 11 o'clock a four ship formation and uh, this is their 2023 display team they are the only civilian helicopter display team in the UK at the moment and uh, for this year it's a four ship but they're hopeful to take back uh, some more helicopters for next year where uh, they're going to be bringing the team up to higher numbers so the gazelle helicopter was designed by aerospatiale in the south of france in the late 60s and it's a five-seat aircraft that can be used in all of the three services for pilot training it was used for battlefield observation for light transport reconnaissance and uh, in the case of the British Army, it was used as an air observation post and directing artillery fire onto the enemy. Thankfully, uh, when they retired from service, a lot of them were picked up uh, from Middle Wallop. And uh, we see them uh, still carrying on. They're a great aircraft, easy to uh, service and maintain as well, as easy as a helicopter can be. Uh, helicopters are exponentially more expensive to operate than a fixed wing aircraft because there's a lot more moving parts on them but uh, it's a fast uh, aircraft as well that you expect for its role if it's doing battlefield uh, observation you want to be able to get in and get out very quickly uh, famous for its nap of the earth flying capabilities as well great visibility from uh, that big glass nose that you'll see very shortly It also was the first aircraft to uh, have what's called a ducted fan, or a Fenstrom tail, and a tail rotor at the back. And here we are, ladies and gentlemen, the Gazelle display team. Gives it that very unique uh, sound as well. The Fenstrom tail is uh, very quiet as well. That helps in battlefield uh, conditions, keeps your observation by the enemy, very, very quiet. Keep it, keep it quiet and sneak up on them. So anything that keeps your noise down, those Fenstrom tails do that, uh, is a help. So Fenstrom, if you speak French, of course is uh, derived from the French word window, Fenstrom, so it's like a window into the tail rotor. Has a cruising speed of 164 miles an hour and a maximum speed of 193, and that is fast for a helicopter. Most uh, production helicopters today, twin squirrels, things like that, you'll be cruising around 120, maybe 140. I once did a flight back from uh, Middlesbrough to London in a, in a twin squirrel, and oh, that was horrible. It was like 120, 140 all the way, very bumpy. So, um, to go 160 is uh, very fast, but up to 190 is even better. And it also actually still holds the record. It's the fastest single-engine helicopter 
manufactured today. The team operate from their base in uh, Landmead Airfield near Wantage. And it's made up predominantly of ex-Army Air Force and Royal Marine and Royal Navy pilots. It has a fantastic ground crew uh, who give up their time. They're all volunteers uh, throughout the year to assist in bringing these fantastic aircraft to display circuits. And I've been to many shows where uh, they've had their own uh, on-site presence as well, where you could buy merchandise. So uh, a real dedicated band of uh, followers. Of course, none of that would be possible without uh, the generosity of the owners of Falcon Aviation, uh, who uh, assist in the maintenance of the aircraft. And as I said, that can be uh, quite expensive when it comes to uh, rotary aircraft. And uh, if you are lucky enough to see the aircraft on the ground, you'll see they are immaculate. They're like they're just come out of the factory. So, uh, I've been told that the aircraft are better looking than the pilots, even. That's how well maintained they are. So it's a lightweight aircraft, given the power that's involved with it. So it's got a very good power to weight ratio. She's considered to be a true pilot's aircraft, but many pilots christening her the Jaguar E-type of the skies. I know it has another uh, name. Uh, in the army, it was referred to as the screaming chicken leg. Oh, it looks like a chicken leg. And that noise that you hear is coming through, that whining, that high pitch whine, that's actually the compressor intake system at the front of the engine uh, that's making that noise. So it's not the rotor blades. So the aircraft being flown today, the lead aircraft there, the Blue X Empire Test Pilot School is a HT2. And you can see that extended probe on the nose, and that was used to measure the aircraft's movement very, very accurately. And uh, it had the original registration of XE-939, and it was used uh, by the test school down in Boscombe Down, down in Wiltshire, uh, up until 2016. So number two aircraft, the one on the right, in the diamond formation is an ex-Royal Air Force, and that's a HT-3, so a slightly later version. Originally uh, registered as XZ-934, and that's been in civilian hands since 2002. Number three, which is the one on the left, is the ex-Royal Navy HT-2, and that's from 705 Squadron, uh, Royal Naval Air Station Coldrose. When it was in service, it was registered as XW-8. 857. And the reason I'm giving out these registrations is I guarantee you some of the crowd here giving the crowd somebody's dad or somebody's uncle will go, I worked on that aircraft. I, I used to fly that aircraft. My mate Barry once got a lift in that aircraft. And also we used that when they, they had their own display team, the Royal Navy, it used to be called the Sharks, and that was one of the Sharks aircraft. It was used in the 85. And then the number four aircraft, the one at the back, uh, was uh, originally uh, in service at the Royal Navy 705 Squadron. That was built in 1975. And uh, today's pilot, um, Cav Medicine, Kev, he enjoyed his first helicopter solo flight in this aircraft. How cool is that? Imagine that was the first aircraft that he flew solo in. And then all these years later, you know, that was back in June of uh, 83, and all of these years later, he's displaying the very aircraft that he took his first helicopter solo flight in. That really is very, very good. The team is staffed by volunteer pilots, as I said. Uh, leader is Tim Gray, a former Royal Marine and current RAF officer. Experienced operations all over the world with multiple types of aircraft. Tim is currently flying uh, the C-17 as well at 99 Squadron. He flies Norton, he's got 8,000 hours. 3,000 of which are on the Gazelle, and he's a former member of the Royal Air Force Blue Eagles. Number two pilot, Andy uh, Wellesley, he's been flying well over 40 years. He flew as military pilot initially with the Royal Marines and then with the Army Air Corps, and he flew the Gazelle and the Lynx, where he operated in uh, Falklands, Belize, Bosnia, Cyprus, and all over Europe, uh, crewing uh, over 2,000 hours on Gazelles. He now flies commercial flying the Global 6000, nice, nice piece of kit that. He has 7,000 flight hours in total. 
when he's not flying around in his gazelle. He does a lot of running, cycling, and playing golf badly. He's also got a Piper Arrow. Number three is Mitch, one of the longest serving members of the uh, team. He's uh, been with the team since its inception over six years ago, and he set out as an army apprentice avionics technician. So here's somebody that was originally a technician and then became a pilot. That's the opportunities that you get within uh, the army. And number four is uh, Kev Matteson, who's also a team manager. Kev joined the Royal Navy in 82, and he flew four different types of service, including Gazelle, Sea King Merlin, and the United States Navy Seahawk. So he obviously uh, did a uh, secondment. Uh, I've just got a quick announcement. Can Louise Hill please attend the first aid post one immediately? Louise Hill, please attend the first aid post number one immediately. If you don't know where that first aid post is, uh, just ask any member with a tabard, they'll be able to direct you straight through it. Louise Hill, please attend the first aid post number one. So as I was saying, Kev Matson, uh, not just the team manager, he's flown many, many different types of helicopters. He flew in the Sharks display team as well, as number four, and was also the solo position. And he's flown over 10 different types of aircraft in 4,500 hours. So a uh, great display by uh, these fantastic uh, machines. You can follow the team on Twitter and Instagram. So uh, if you want to know more about the gazelles, as they exit to the right and head off, but are coming back in, sorry, from my right. Lights on. And as we saw earlier, they're very, very maneuverable. That's why they were so good at uh, low level and across the battlefield as well. That's that Empire test school, the boss come down one leading them in. You can see that big probe I was talking about sticking out in the front. They also had uh, some attack capabilities as well. There was some variants that they mounted uh, machine guns in the doors, uh, the Jimpies, 762 belt-fed machine guns. And uh, I know they messed around a little bit with uh, trying to fire rockets from them as well. Uh, but uh, mainly they were used for the observational role. Because they were quiet, they were fast, they were perfectly suited for that route. So just monitoring them on the display frequency, they're all getting in position as they're gonna come into crowd center, getting ready for their penultimate maneuver. And they'll do the final roulette break. So get your cameras ready. Paul's bringing up the rear. He's gonna slot himself in. Again, you can see slight deviation, not coming straight at us, about a 10 degree off because to cope with that wind that's blowing from their right. Ladies and gentlemen, the Gazelle Formation Helicopter Team. Great display, fantastic. So uh, as I said earlier, we've still got plenty to see in the skies above us. Uh, the SE-5 is going to be heading in soon, the uh, replica uh, aircraft. And then after that, the Rolls-Royce Heritage Harvard aircraft together with the uh, Heritage Spitfire. And uh, then we're going to come bang up to date with the latest and greatest, the Royal Air Force Typhoon. Full reheat with those EJ2000 engines chucking out over 50,000 pounds of thrust and full reheat. 
and uh, finishing the show, we've saved the best to last, the Royal Air Force Red Arrows. So the Gazelle's going back to line astern and they'll head back to Prestwick. And again, I've got to say a big thanks to Prestwick. Everybody at Prestwick has been so accommodating, helping us with the airspace, uh, all the refueling on the aprons with the ramps. We've got one of their air traffic controllers in here with us with the flight control committee and uh, without their help it would have been impossible to manage this airspace. So a big thanks to everybody at Presswick who made this possible. So the gazelles are going to head off to our right and uh, we're going to get ready for the next act which is a unique aircraft. We're going back in history, uh, back to the First World War where aircraft development like most uh, wars proved a rapid succession of new designs and uh, this aircraft was a uh, testament to that. It was very successful um, in its own right and uh, we're very very pleased to have it today. Neil at the controls, the aircraft is a, a 7 8 size replica of a 1917 World War I SE-5A Scout. Um, the real ones are in museums because they were built in 1917, so uh, not many of them fly. I think uh, Shotworth made it one, uh, but this aircraft is uh, quite unique, so uh, we're going to see it through its paces as well. The SE-5, together with the Sopwith Camel, performed the backbone operations of fighters, and uh, even at the time of uh, their development, the Royal Air Force in itself was just... Uh, becoming an idea and uh, tactics, all of that was still being developed. But uh, the SC-5 together with the Sopwith Camel coming in from your left uh, is uh, very much part of that story. So I can see it now on my left hand side coming in from your left Wind deflecting up a little bit, so he's lifted his wing just to compensate for that. But let's just listen to this engine. Very different from the Merlin, which will come along through the years. This aircraft is uh, equipped with a 100 horsepower Rolls-Royce engine. So we saw the Grop 109 a little bit earlier, that modern glider, that had a 95 horsepower uh, engine, and that's a glider. So this was cutting edge at the time. This was the typhoon of the day of 2017, and it has a 100 horsepower Rolls-Royce. Uh, it uses unleaded aircraft fuel, and uh, the aircraft, like the original, is constructed of wood with a fabric covering and uh, wire bracing. It took six years to build this aircraft. 1980 and 1986. And first flown at the Strat Allen Aircraft Museum. The markings on it uh, of the aircraft that we're seeing here today is uh, Rupert Henry Jones, the 39 steps film. The aircraft can only be landed on grass, um, as if you look closely at the back of the aircraft, it hasn't got a wheel. Got a tail skid, so uh, you've got to land on grass and the tail skid skidding along the grass. That's what's the brake. There is no brakes on the wheels, so as you can tell, aircraft have just been developed. So they've tried to keep this as a, it would have been easy for them to say, Hey, let's just put some disc brakes on it, and, uh, but no, he's kept it as original as possible, and uh, even down to the fact that you have to use a, a piece of wood dragging along the grass to slow it down. The original aircraft would have had two guns, uh, a Lewis gun on the top wing and a Vickers flying through the propeller. And that interrupter gear to allow them to fly through the propeller, that was a, a recent development. In fact, it wasn't development by the Allies, it was uh, the Germans that had developed the interrupter gear and it wasn't until one of the Fokkers had crashed uh, behind enemy lines that they managed to salvage the uh, interrupter gear and then that was uh, a complete new uh, dawn of aviation, but the Lewis gun would be strapped on top of the wing and another one would uh, be firing through the propeller. 
So Neil is uh, a retired surgeon and he's also an active farmer with a lifelong interest in aviation. And uh, again, I said it earlier, where did he learn to fly? In gliding. Uh, he went to the CCF cadets at the uh, Queen's expense. Same as me, I went to the Air Training Corps, 1349 Squadron in Woking. So if you have got a passion for aviation, uh, there is affordable ways to get into it. And I cannot recommend the uh, Air Training Corps, the ATC. That was my first flight in a chipmunk. And I thought, right, this is what I want to do. And uh, luckily enough, years later, I managed to get my own pilot's license. But uh, Neil is the same. He went through the cadet system. And uh, he's also an airworthy inspector for the Light Aircraft Association. And uh, the flight today, as we can see, is uh, just a display of the agility of this uh, World War I aircraft. Rolls-Royce uh, powered engine doing it proud in this windy conditions. Originally the uh, flyers of uh, the uh, First World War would have got airborne were carrying just revolvers and shotguns uh, to shoot at each other. But uh, it only took within about six to eight months before they realized, hey, let's strap a Lewis gun on the top of the wing. And, uh, this was a sort of halfway house. The Sopwith Camel was the first aircraft to enter service that had forward firing guns through the propeller. But because they weren't quite sure about the technology, they sort of hedged their bets, so they put one Lewis gun on the wing. And it's got like a big C-shaped, or like half a C-shaped um, iron rail on it. And you've got to unclip the gun, slide it back, undo the magazine cartridge at the top, take that out, reach down, get another magazine. Oh, hang on, the guy's shooting at me again. So it, was, it wasn't very uh, effective. Uh, but being, by being able to put one gun uh, forward firing, uh, they could load a lot more of uh, uh, the ammo on it. And the one on top was uh, more of a backup for it. But uh, the aircraft is beautifully produced. Uh, we also have uh, another uh, emergency announcement from Ryan Story. Ryan Story, please attend first aid point three. So Ryan Air, uh, Ryan Story, please attend first aid post point three uh, as soon as possible. Again, if you don't know where the first aid uh, point three is, please just ask anybody in the tabard. I'm sure they'll be able to point you in the direction. Ryan Story, please go to first aid point three immediately. Also, uh, propellers, the, uh, all of these aircraft have uh, fixed pitch, what we call fixed pitch propellers. Um, so it was set at a certain angle and uh, that was pretty much it. So before uh, we were able to adjust the pitch on the propeller and uh, that gives it that distinctive noise as well. A lot of them have a very distinctive noise, they have a fixed pitch propeller. And simple little things like the control surfaces. Um, so the ailerons, as I said earlier, they'll control your roll and the ailerons, elevators at the back will control your pitch. Um, the earlier ones of these had just ailerons and uh, control surfaces on one wing. And then somebody came up with the idea, hey, hang on a minute, why don't we put the control surfaces on the top wing and the bottom wing <laughs> as well? So these aircraft developed throughout the war with additions, some will have two control surfaces on the wing, some will have four, and top and bottom. So they, they, it was constant technology evolving. And not over years, but over months, sometimes over weeks. So Neil's coming through for his final pass, giving us a wing waggle. Traditional pilot's wave. Fantastic display, thank you very much, Neil. And uh, just heard him say cheerio on the display frequency. And uh, wonderful display for the SE5. So now we're going to move forward in time. It's uh, First World War is finished and we're approaching the Second World War. Now the problem that we've got is the Luftwaffe have built up a massive force. They've had Spain as a training ground. Their aircraft are cutting edge. They're all monoplanes. We had just introduced the first monoplane fighter, the Hurricane was the first monoplane and enclosed cockpit that the RAF had to serve. 
Um, but now we've got a problem. It's 1938, 39, and we need to train pilots. We have not got enough pilots in the United Kingdom. And uh, the aircraft that came to the rescue, there was two aircraft, the Boeing Stearman and the next aircraft we're going to see, the Heritage Harvard. And the Harvard aircraft uh, served in great numbers to teach um, the pilots before they stepped up into the Mustang, into the Spitfire. This was the tail dragger uh, to teach all tail draggers. And it's still used today for exactly that purpose. I don't know any uh, Spitfire pilot or Mustang pilot uh, that flies today that has not done time in a Harvard. Um, I was lucky enough to spend a couple of years with uh, a good friend of mine called Norman Lees, Captain Norman Lees, and he had his own Harvard and he taught me what we call engine management or movement management because it's not the most powerful aircraft but it's heavy so uh, you've got to plan ahead. Um, it's not really comfortable inside, uh, it's quite cramped and uh, also um, it's got a glass house canopy so visibility is great but wow did it teach you about uh, watching your airspeed, watch your airspeed, watch your airspeed, constantly you were watching your airspeed because that was uh, the difference between the aircraft moving forward or rapidly downwards as you stall. And uh, the Harvard is still used today uh, to great effect for training display pilots. And uh, we have to say a big thank you to Rolls-Royce uh, for providing the, the aircraft. They also have provided a Spitfire for us, uh, which will be along very shortly as well. I've got to say a uh, big thanks to Ashley, Scotland Limited. Um, they are our main sponsors. They're a locally based main contractor and they do a huge range of construction projects, everything from affordable housing, residential education, healthcare, leisure and industries. And uh, thank you for uh, providing the sponsorship that we needed to bring this fantastic show to everybody for free, together with the Airshare Council. And uh, they have a strong belief in uh, giving back to the community, which uh, is uh, manifested in their apprenticeship and professional trainee programs. And uh, if you want to know more about them, have a look up on ashleyscotland.co.uk. And together with Spirit Aero Systems, um, it's one of the world's largest manufacturers of aero structures, and they serve the commercial aviation, defense, and regional uh, business sectors as well. Spirit's expertise extends across aluminum and advanced composite manufacturing, and also the company's core product, whose fuselage, integrated wings, wing components, pylons, and nacelles. So uh, they're located out in Presswick Airport. They have all around the world, US, France, Malaysia, Northern Ireland, but they're also based out at Presswick, where over a thousand people are uh, employed. And uh, they do everything from engineering, procurement, and uh, pop down to the STEM marquee, and you can have a chat with the guys from Spirit, They're proud sponsors of the International Air Show Festival of Flight. So uh, just to remind you, we have the Harvard coming up very shortly. After that, then the Spitfire. Then just after five o'clock, we'll be having the Typhoon, the Royal Air Force Typhoon. And then uh, I'm gonna be handing over the microphone to uh, Red 10, the uh, commentator from the uh, Red Arrows. So plenty still going on uh, in the skies over there. As I said earlier, the uh, aircraft that we're going to see, it's a very distinctive uh, color scheme, yellow. That goes back to its training lineage. And uh, it's part of the Rolls-Royce Heritage Flight Mission. And uh, Rolls-Royce keep these aircraft flying to inspire and to educate and promote aviation heritage throughout the uh, 
operation and demonstration of these rare and historical accurate aircraft, the engines and the artifacts included with them. So the uh, harbour's just come on frequency and uh, he's been cleared into the box or, or display area by the flight display director. And uh, as I said, these aircraft are showcasing historic design and engineering excellence while describing the pathway to the modern technology that we see and sustainability through STEM, media visits and promotional activity. So the aircraft serve, still serving their purpose and they tell a story and commemorate those who fought for their country worldwide. Because these aircraft were used worldwide, massive amounts of them in Canada, and Australia, and in India as well. So, uh, not just in the UK. The Harvard is uh, powered by a beautiful Pratt & Whitney engine. Amazing part of design. If you ever get a chance to see one of these engines in there, in the museum, have a good look at them. Just uh, when you think it's 1936 when it was, uh, you know, built, it's just a real piece of kit. So I can see it way off to my left hand side at my nine o'clock. He's at height and he'll be turning in soon. The harbour that we're going to see is a 2B, registration KF183. Now the basic design of these aircraft went back to 1935 and this type of aircraft was used as I said by many air forces as an advanced trainer prior to the progression of the fighters, Mustang and Spitfire. It entered service, this aircraft, with number 7 advanced flying unit at Connington in December of 44, so just near the end of the war. And that rasping sound you hear is not coming from the engine, that's coming from the very tip of the propeller as it goes supersonic. And that's why you hear it coming and going as the aircraft propeller just enters into supersonic and then backs off as well. So as I said, it entered service in December of 44 and then she was retired from service, get this, in 2016. So, it's uh, from 1944 to 2016. That's how relevant the aircraft was. They don't keep an aircraft at Boscombe Down because it looks good, however, it's a piece of history. Boscombe Down is pure learning down there, pushing the technology edge, and this aircraft from way, way back still had a, a role to play. So, it retired at Boscombe Down, as I said, in 2016. It had amassed 15,000 hours and it holds the record as the Royal Air Force's longest serving aircraft. Engine is powered by a Pratt & Whitney 1340cc WASP radial engine. And that produces about 600 horsepower. And you think, oh wow, that's quite a lot of power. Well, it's not, it's a big heavy airframe. And it's only got a two-bladed prop. So uh, it's not particularly fast. It has a maximum speed of about 230 miles an hour. You would think with all that power it'd be able to go a little bit faster, but uh, no. So flying the car due to have the Rolls Royce Harbour display pilot. Yeah. Okay, so we'll get the table ready for you straight away. <laughs> Great to get. So Steg joined the army straight from school. And after completing his initial training at uh, the Royal Military Academy in Sandhurst, he was posted on attachment to the Cheshire Regiment as an infantry platoon commander. What is an infantry platoon commander do is by the way, you would ask? Well, he subsequently trained as an anti-tank helicopter pilot, moving up through the Army Air Corps. And uh, with that, he then went into Germany, deployed on two operational tours as well, which was followed by an instructional tour at Middle Wallop. Way down south, and that's where all the uh, army helicopters hang out. He led the British Army Blue Eagles helicopter display team in 1997, uh, prior to leaving the services. And 
and uh, after that he then went on to fly for Thomas Cook, uh, flying 757s, uh, but then switched from mass transportation to a little bit more exclusive because he was then flying the Gulfstream, the, the 550 and the 650, so the latest and greatest of the Gulfstreams. That aircraft he was flying with uh, was for JCB and Tesco. I wonder if he uses Tesco card with that on the Gulfstream 650. Uh, Steg has been working with the Rolls-Royce Flight Operations Team since 2016. And uh, he joined full-time in 2020. Uh, but he also flies the company Gulfstream and is the chief pilot for Rolls-Royce Heritage Flight. Oh, now it makes sense. He's got his Gulfstream rating, so yeah, that makes complete sense. He currently flies the Harvard as well as the Mustang through the races, because they do have a Mustang as well. And uh, the Harvard would, as I said, be used to train the pilots for the Mustang and for the Spitfire that we're going to see very shortly. So Steg's just called one minute, so he's going to be coming in for his penultimate pass, I would think, before he comes back again. Beautiful paint scheme, this looks amazing in the sun. A little wave from him as well. Another thing about the Harvard, because I'm just thinking about him, he's going back to land now. All's well and good when you go into land, but the minute the tail comes down, that big long nose in front of you just pops straight up. And it really is not a great aircraft to taxi on the ground. You've got to be wiggling your rudder all the time to make sure you can see what's coming in front of you. So uh, again, that teaches the pilots uh, to uh, taxi the aircraft because when they move forward onto the Mustang and the Spitfire, it's an even longer nose. So there we go, top up display, give him a wave for his last pass, the Rolls-Royce Heritage Harbour 2B. Again, these aircraft are all uh, flying out of Presswick, and that's where he's going to head back to now. And uh, they'll be lined up on the apron. And uh, I doubt if they'll fly back tonight. They'll probably stay on the fly out in the morning. And there he goes, heading off into the sunset. Reminds me of my good old friend, Captain Norman Lees, when we used to go flying in that. Great to hear the Harvard again and see it. Oh, a little victory roll there as he heads out. Cheerio. And again, if you do a roll in the Harvard, the very first thing you want to do is make sure that nose is pointing up, okay? You do not want to roll, even if it's level. That nose has to be 10, 15 degrees up. Now I can start rolling. So, uh, great display for us, Dick. Thanks very much. And uh, that means we're going to be enjoying the beautiful sounds of a Spitfire next. Now... As I said, I have a hard and fast rule. I do not talk over Spitfires when they're in front of me. I want to hear the Merlins. So don't think I'm being rude and ignoring you. I just won't talk over it. So, if we listen and look to our left-hand side, the classic Orje Mitchell shape of that elliptical wing is coming back. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce you to the Spitfire PS853. Oh, that sounds good, doesn't it? 
as like a cool, refreshing drink to your ears. Amazing sound. So the Rolls-Royce Spitfire that we see in front of us, a PS853, it's an unarmed, high-altitude reconnaissance aircraft, one of a batch of 79 uh, that were built, and it's uh, a Mark 14. So what do we know about Mark 14s, boys and girls? What's the, what's the answer? What happened after Mark 12s? That's right, they all swapped from Merlins to Griffin engines. It is definitely a different sound. So the Mark 14s were powered by 2,000 horsepower Griffin 65s or 60s, and they represent the pinnacle of the Spitfire's development in terms of speed and altitude top speed of 446 miles an hour and a ceiling up to 42,000 feet. PS853 was delivered to the Central Photography Reconnaissance Unit, the RAF Benson, in January of 45, so uh, just as the war was coming to an end, before moving into Belgium and Holland. The aircraft was engaged in active service with number 16 squadron right up until the end of the war and participated in Operation Crossbow. That, of course, was that operation to uh, detect V1s and V2, the vengeance weapons, the launch sites. The end of the war it remained in Germany until March of 46 and then it was placed in storage back in the UK and then in 1950 it was one of several Mark 14 Spitfires selected for conversion to conduct meteorological research known as the temperature and humidity of the upper air mass flight. Wow, that's a, I bet that badge was huge. In the, PS 853 performed the last ever Spitfire uh, sortie on, with regards to that in June of 57. And along with her sister Mark 14 PM 631 and PS 915, this aircraft retired into ceremonial display duties to form the Royal Air Force Historical Aircraft Flight, forerunner of today's Battle of Britain flight. In 96, Rolls-Royce bought the aircraft to replace the original uh, Mark 14 that they had, which was uh, out of service, and the aircraft was re-registered. That beautiful paint scheme we see today is uh, representative of number 16 photographic reconnaissance squadron. It's commonly known on the circuit, we all, we all call this the Rolls-Royce Spitfire. And wildly recognized as an ambassador for Rolls-Royce, appearing in air displays and charity events and also corporate functions. And uh, as I said earlier, this aircraft represents the heritage of the Spitfire and the Rolls-Royce engine that power them, highly highlighting that constant technical development of both aircraft and its engines. And honors the pilots of all the nations who flew them and the men and the women who built and maintained them. The aircraft is based in a dedicated hangar up at East Midlands Airport near Derby. And it can usually be seen around a display circuit between April and October. And then for the winter months, back in the hangar, and let's do the annual maintenance on it. Ian Smitty Smith, or Smithy as we call him, is the Rolls Royce Spitfire pilot. He joined the Royal Air Force at the tender age of 17 in 1983. Then served at uh, RAF Gottesloe in Germany, flying the Chinook helicopter, the deployments in Northern Ireland and the Falklands.
Smithy then spent the 90s as a QFI in Yorkshire, flew Jaguar, where he uh, also went on operational duties in Yugoslavia and Iraq. And uh, he also flew the Hawks with uh, a team you may know, the Red Arrows, uh, when they were based out of Cranwell. So coming through for the last time at the controls, Ian Smithy Smith and the Rolls Royce Spitfire. There he goes, heading north into the sunset. Beautiful sight. Thank you very much, Rolls-Royce. Uh, fantastic display. And uh, that together with the Harvard. I said earlier, they're going to Presswick. They're actually up in Glasgow, I've been told. Uh, so they're, they're loss. Would have been better if they stayed in Presswick, if you ask me. So uh, that's moving through history. As I said, we start with that SE5, First World War. You know, fighters have just sort of been developed. Then we go into the training of fighting pilots before the start of the Second World War. Then it's moved forward. We're in the uh, late 40s, the Spitfire with the Griffin engine. But we've reached the edge now of what a propeller aircraft could do. The propeller itself is now becoming the obstacle. So the jet gets involved. Oh my word, this is a fantastic thing that we've come up with. It's called a jet. You suck the air and you, you light the petrol and it blows up inside the machine it comes out the end and you get this thing called thrust so we're now going to jump straight up to date with the latest and the greatest that uh, there is flying out there it is of course the uh, royal air force typhoon and uh, we're very pleased to have it back it did an amazing display last night the sun had set it was sort of dawn it was you know there was very little light and when he hit the reheat we could just see this massive flame 20 feet sticking out the back it just looked amazing uh, you'll still be able to see the reheat uh, of the aircraft today so uh, don't worry about that this year's uh, royal air force typhoon display call sign anarchy one is piloted by flight lieutenant matt brighty He's a QFI with 29 Squadron based at Coningsby. And uh, I'm sure everybody's been looking at that uh, latest TV program on Channel 4, that Top Gun. And so there are the guys out at Coningsby doing the QRA. So Matt joined the Royal Air Force as a direct entry in 2007. He graduated and uh, undertook elementary flight training on the Grop Shooter, after which he. Uh, and streamed into fly fast jets. Matt went on to earn his uh, wings on the T1, the jet, the Hawk jet, in Orient Valley. And uh, then from there, he moved on to the GR4 Tornado. Uh, a little heads up, it is very, very loud. So if you've got kids, make sure uh, they know about it, because it can be a shock for them. So especially when he hits the reheat. So Matt then, uh, after he left Lossy Mouth, went on to 617 Squadron, of course the famous Dan Buster Squadron, where he served for just under a year before the squadron disbanded in 2014. And then he moved on to 9 Bomber Squadron at Orient Mara. Um, that was his time on the Tornado. He went uh, on numerous operational deployments in Afghanistan, uh, flying out to Cyprus, where he's flown over Iraq and Syria. And uh, then he moved across in 2017 to the Typhoon. So I've got a message for uh, Ryan Story. Ryan Story, please attend First Aid Point 3 ASAP. Ryan, we need you to go to the First Aid Point 3. Ryan Story to First Aid Point 3. So in 2017, as I said, Matt moved across the Typhoon. He was posted to 11 Fighter Squadron, where he qualified uh, as a swing roll pairs lead and participated in numerous overseas deployments. Been down Baltic Air Policing in Estonia, down to the Falklands. 
Matt returned to 29 Squadron in 2020, where he became a QFI. 29 Squadron, of course, responsible for training both air crew and ground crew from the UK part and partner nations, not just the, the Royal Air Force, but overseas Air Force's comfort are training there as well. How to operate and maintain the Typhoon. So, running in, from your left, the Royal Air Force, Typhoon. that delta wing, the slats, leading edge slats that help change the aerodynamics of the aircraft, fantastic roll rate as well. The aircraft is going through uh, a new radar setup, it's a system called Radar 2 that's going to transform the aircraft, its performance and its delivery of uh, weapons. Typhoon is uh, built with modular design, so exactly uh, that, as it goes through its life cycle, they'll be able to upgrade uh, the aircraft without any, making any major changes to the structure of it. Now, watch as it goes into the vertical. It's coming right out the sun, classic fiber. And folks will go down. So with uh, the advent of Radar 2 for the Typhoon fleet, it's going to nearly double their uh, radar range. And the aircraft is fully capable now, not just air-to-air, -air, but also air-to-ground interdiction. Watch as he comes through the center. that amazing roll rate that gives it such a good air to air capability as well and uh, the aircraft is what we call a fourth generation fighter maybe a 4.5 with its upgrades it's uh, not stealthy in the traditional sense it has some stealth uh, coatings and it uh, it's not huge on the radar but compared to the new f-35s that are coming on it's got a pretty decent radar cross return especially with external loads carried like it does so slow roll as he goes through. Now we're going to see the uh, slower part of the flight envelope as he throttles the aircraft back. So the aircraft has got computers on board and the computers are talking to each other all the time, thousands, thousands uh, times a second. Uh, they're comparing the uh, feed coming back from the aircraft from the sensor itself. So uh, they're, they're sort of voting, you know, is this the right thing? So we're going to see what's called a high alpha approach now so he's pitching the nose up if you've got binoculars and you can see the canards at the front you'll see them moving very very quickly and that's the computer so the fly-by-wire system is now taken over so the aircraft doesn't stall he's pitched the aircraft up but now he's going to reintroduce the afterburner and just push the power forward These aircraft are over 25 tons. Think about that, 25 tons of aircraft just hanging in the air like a helicopter. 
And look, it just pushes the power forward on those EJ 2000s and it just goes straight forward. So that shows you the power to weight ratio uh, that the aircraft enjoys. Of course, it has super cruise as well, which means it can go faster than the speed of sound without engaging the afterburners, which can be uh, detrimental to your fuel bill. The pilot is uh, sitting on his Martin Baker ejector seat in a, in a recline. He has a, a HOTAS system, so that means hands-on throttle and stick. So his left hand has, probably, I think it's about 17 functions that the throttle can do. So he doesn't have to physically move his hand. Oh, great shot. So that's the condensation. The air is moist. Maximum rate turn here, maximum 360s. He's pitching, he's pulling 9G. His G suit will be inflating all the way around there, trying to stop the blood moving from the top of his head down into his lower body. Typhoon also enjoys the, the latest and greatest in the helmet technology world. And, uh, you can monitor nearly all of the systems on the aircraft in his visor. With the knife edge on the way down. And also it enjoys uh, voice activation, so he can actually talk to the aircraft. And uh, it'll recognize certain commands, so he doesn't have to engage or reach a switch. He'll uh, just ask it to select radar modes, maybe select some weapons, and uh, the aircraft will respond. Another beauty of these aircraft is that they have a very, very capable maintenance system. So the aircraft is constantly maintaining itself. It's uh, looking for faults. It can see problems coming up so every time it lands. Uh, the first thing that's plugged into this is not a fuel bowser, but a computer. And, uh, the aircraft will tell the operators, hey, this wasn't right, or that wasn't right. Uh, as you'd expect, incredibly powerful. So get ready as uh, we can see the aircraft coming back around for one of its penultimate maneuvers. Now, the weather is perfect for... Uh, his end show, he's going to go into a vertical climb, storm the aircraft up to about five or six thousand feet. Now you can see the moisture in the air, and the reason you can see that forming over the top of the aircraft as it's going through the air is the mass of the aircraft is actually heating the moisture in the air so it's in effect boiling the air around it because you've got this massive big shape moving through wet air and uh, it's heating the air around it and you get these beautiful photographic opportunities with the typhoon. Oh. There we go into the vertical power 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 all the way up Oh, look at that. Just around the top. Ladies and gentlemen, the Royal Air Force Typhoon. Well, it will get better because coming up next, it is the Royal Air Force and the Red Arrows.
Hey, uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. Ian, Ian here in the um, production trailer. Thank you very much for watching today. It's uh, got the red arrows to come up, of course. Uh, the highlight for many. I'm watching flight radar here, and uh, looks like uh, Presswick are about to get a nice uh, low fly pass from the Typhoon. We can't quite see that from here. In previous year, was years here shooting at air. I know we've um, been able to get stuff over the top of the airport, which is out to our sort of northeast. Can't quite see the typhoon, unfortunately. So we've got these lovely crowd shots instead. I hope that's enough for you as we build up towards the Red Arrows to bring the show to a close. Nice to see Tom in the chat, talking about bit rates. Thank you, Tom. We are actually on Starlink with a couple of 4G backups. Um, the 4G backups are not up to very much today, so sorry if it's um, floating around bit rate-wise. Bit rate but that is uh, Starlink uh, hunting around the... Um, yeah, the uh, internet setup down here a little bit restrictive, unfortunately, including the hardwired. Uh, anyway, not get into the weeds on um, internet connections and uh, bit rates, but uh, it is what it is. Lovely to see so many of you. Good 3,000 uh, of you viewing, ready for the red arrow. Good afternoon, Scotland. Good afternoon, Air. I am squad leader Gray Muscat. I'm Red 10, the team supervisor with the Royal Air Force Aerobatic Team. It's the Red Arrows! Wow. What a welcome. What a fantastic sight to see so many people on the shore and on the expedition ground behind me. The team are airborne out of Presswick Airport and they'll soon be coming from the rear for to display. As a team supervisor, one of my roles is to ensure that the team makes sure that they adhere to all the rules and regulations in the display. And also give you some more information about the wider Royal Air Force, about the Red Arrows, and also guide your eyes into the correct piece of sky so you do not miss a single second of the action. We had a busy day today. We were earlier, we are at Blackpool Airport. We meant to display at Southport. However, the weather at Blackpool precluded that display and we were unable to uh, display there, so we cancelled. However, we then flew up to Presswick. We landed, we sorted ourselves out. We turned the jet. The engineers refueled, replenished the smoke, and now we're all eight jets are airborne for display here. It's a very dis busy display this season. This year, it's 59th display season. We're about... Well, we're actually almost to the end of the season. We've got about two weeks left before we end 2023. We'll then take a small break and get ourselves ready for 2024, train our new pilots and get ready for next season. One of the roles of the Red Arrows is, of course, to represent the Royal Air Force, which is on duty 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And we do that through our quick reaction air force, our quick reaction aircraft, the Typhoon, which you've just seen there displayed by Flepton Matt Brighty. A phenomenal piece of equipment which safeguards the skies of the UK and all our NATO and Allied partners. In addition to that, in addition to that, we use the heavy lift transport and heavy lift helicopters such as C-17 and Chinook aircraft during humanitarian aid all across the world to ensure that those less fortunate with us receive the necessary help. I'm just in comms with the team to ensure that all their pre-show checks are conducted and they are cleared to display and are ready. There are three types of show that we can do. It's either a full show, a rolling show or a flat show. The full show needs five and a half thousand feet of cloud base or airspace, two and a half thousand feet for a rolling and one thousand feet for a flat show. Hopefully we should be able to get a full show today. But when the team arrive, make sure you give them a massive round of applause, a massive cheer, and I will transmit that cheer to the team. Get them all pumped up, ready for display. However, Scotland, air, please put your hands together for the 2023 Royal Air Force Aerobatic Team. It's the Red Arrows! 
team arriving in wall formation. That's 200 to 300 feet wide from left wing tip to right wing tip. They arrive at over 400 miles per hour. They pull up at 4G and collapse into eight arrow. The smoke comes off and they reach a height of about five and a half to 6,000 feet before Red One brings them back down to their minimum display height. Red One twists the team to the left. Red One this year is squad leader Tom Bold. He is in his third and final year as Red One, the team leader. He was also in the team between 2015 and 17, where he was the synchro leader in 2017. He's also flown Typhoon on operational service. He's a qualified flying instructor on the Hawk T Mark II and Tucano where he was the Tucano display pilot in 2010, as the smoke comes on for the eight arrow present. Keep your eye on the team for a dynamic shape change. As Red 7-8 perform a rollback and change the shape from eight arrow into Vixen. As Red One brings the team round to the right, you can see it's in Vixen formation. Of course, if we were a nine ship, we'd now be in our trademark Diamond Nine with number nine at the back. However, for 2023, we are only an eight ship, and that is down to the fact we can only train three new pilots safely with the correct level of supervision each year, and simply the mass didn't work out for this year. However, next year for our own 60th anniversary, our own Diamond Jubilee, our plan is to be back at our Diamond 9 and our trademark 9 shape for the entire season. As the team come round to the right, get your cameras ready for the Vixen roll. As the team roll to the left on the right hand side of Red 1 is Red 2, Flight Lieutenant Rich Walker. Rich is in his first year on the team. He's an extremely experienced pilot, having flown operations on both the Harrier and the Typhoon, as well as being a qualified flying instructor on the Hawk T Mark II. As I said, eight pilots in the display this year. There are 10 pilots on the team. The eight you see in front of you. Myself, Red 10, former Tornado GR4 pilot, qualified flying instructor on the Hawk T Mark II. I also fly the spare jet in between shows and also fly the jet around the display taking airborne images. We are also commanded by Officer Commanding Rafa, which is Wing Commander Adam Collins. He's a former Tornado GR4 pilot. He's also flown the F-111 while exchange with the Australian Air Force. And he's also a former qualified flying instructor on the Hawk T Mark 1. You can see the team come now round from the right they've moved their way into apollo as red one brings them around for the apollo loop once again red one pulls them up at over 400 miles per hour and 4g they reach a height of over five and a half thousand feet and the aircraft now is starting to slow to approximately 110 to 120 miles per hour. Which means that the controls of the, the aircraft are lost less effective. Conversely, as the aircraft starts to descend, they now increase speed through 200, 300, back to that 400 miles per hour, where the controls are a lot more effective, making the pilots work even more harder as they come around to the left. Four. The Apollo present. On the left of Red One is Red Three, Flight Lieutenant Tom Hansford. Tom is in his first year on the team. He's a former Typhoon pilot and qualified weapons instructor on the Typhoon, which meant that he would teach weapon technical information and all frontline tactics to the entire Typhoon Force. Reds 2 and 3, smoke comes on as the entire centre section makes their way rearwards to the second of our space-themed shapes. We had the Apollo from the Apollo space missions 
And now they've moved into Eagle from the Eagle Lunar Landing Craft. And you can see Reds 4 and 5 all the way back at the formation, which makes it extremely difficult for them as we take all our formation references from Red 1, not necessarily the closest aircraft to you. As the smoke comes on for the Eagle present. As I said, the second of our space theme shapes, as the Royal Air Force acknowledges, that space plays an important part in future military operations. And in 2021, UK Space Command was formed. And UK Space Command reached its initial operating capability in 2022. Reds 4 and 5 now smoke as they make their way forward to sit alongside Reds 2 and 3, and Reds 7 and 8 in trail. And in May 2023, the Royal Air Force celebrated the 80th anniversary of Op Chastise. That is the most famous mission in World War II to take out the dams in the Ruhr Valley in Germany, which, of course, was carried out by the world famous 617, the Dam Buster Squadron. And of course, the Dam Busters still fly in today's Royal Air Force. However, they now fly the fifth generation latest aircraft, the F-35. Once again, get your cameras ready for the lightning roll. And as the team rolls to the left, on the far right hand side uppermost is Red 4. That's Flight Lieutenant Ollie Suckling. Ollie is also in his first year on the team, a former Tornado GR4 pilot and flying instructor on the Hawk Team Mark 2. His opposite number smoking on the left is Red 5, Flight Lieutenant Patrick Kershaw, known as Paddy. Paddy was Red 3 last year. He's flown the both the Tornado and the Typhoon on operational service. All the pilots on the Red Arrows must have over 1,500 faster hours and be assessed as above average in the air before they can apply to join the team. Those pilots are then whittled down to the final nine. The final nine then take a week's testing with us where they do a formal interview, a formal media interview, and a flying test. Those nine are whittled down to the final three and they become the final pilots for the new season each year. Looking directly to your front now, coming round to the left as the team are now in Signet. You hit that transmission with Red One, giving the commands to the rest of the team. And you can almost be forgiven for the robotic and monotone delivery. And that's because we fly our formation by ear as well as eye. And it means that the guys on the outside of formation are having to put their input in just a little bit earlier than those on the inside to ensure that the formation moves as one. And you don't get a ripple effect down the wing. Looking off to the far right hand side now, you can see the formation, two distinct sections with red seven in eight in trail for one of the most popular, if not the most popular maneuver that we fly in the 2023 show. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, get your cameras ready as the Red Arrows ride the storm in the tornado. Seven and eight, roll, go, and the abort call is made by Red Eight as both Red Seven and Eight roll around the rest of the formation. But of course, Red One doesn't want to make it too easy for the rest of the team, so watch for the colour change. As the red and the blue come on, he bends round to the right and makes the job even more difficult for both red seven and eight.
may be able to see in the front section of aircraft, those aircraft are flying with their air brake out. That's a small door at the base of the aircraft towards the back. This means those pilots are now flying with a higher throttle setting, and it means a hotter engine gas temperature, which makes the smoke burn a lot more brightly. And it also disturbs the airflow out the back of the aircraft, making the smoke billow a lot more fuller. And that ensures that we enhance certain manoeuvres in the display. As we come to the end of the first half, so far you've seen formation flying involving all eight aircraft. As we go into the second half, it's the more high-speed, fast-paced, heart-pumping, jaw-dropping formation, which now involves two distinct sections. You have Reds 1 through 5, they're now known as Enid, named after Enid Blyton's famous five. And you've got Reds 6, 7 and 8, now known as Hannah, named after squad leader Ray Hannah, one of the first members of the Red Arrows, who's attributed of taking the team from a 7 to a 9, and also are forming our trademark Diamond 9. However, look directly to your front for the start of the second half. Get your cameras ready. This is the detonator. <laughs> Enid breaking first, followed by Hannah. You've got red six off to the left, rod seven off to the right, red eight up over the top. That tone in the radio transmission is actually red six, giving the commands to seven and eight to break. And this allows him to talk to Hannah formation without stepping on the voice transmission of red one. You now have the synchro pair. You've got red seven off to the right, red six off to the left. And they are led by red six, the synchro leader. That is squad leader James Turner, known as JT, in his fourth and final year on the team. He's a former Typhoon pilot, a former instructor on the Typhoon, and qualified flying instructor on the Hawk Team Op 1. Each of those aircraft now dive to only 100 feet above the sea. They've got a closing speed of over 800 miles per hour as they look to pass within only 100 feet of the other. Each aircraft performs a four-point hesitation roll. And now turn hard, pull up to 6G, away from the display line, turning hard back towards the centre as they complete the manoeuvre called Cyclone. To our front, look to your right hand side, red eight coming in, 450 miles per hour with a blue smoke in trail. And if you look to your left, far in the distance, you can see a small trail of red. The smoke comes on as Enid put themselves and into an inverted V as red eight flies the goose. Red one gathers the rest of Enid and this formation bend around to the left. Underneath the aircraft, you might be able to see a small fuel tank. It's actually the smoke pod. That smoke pod is capable of producing five minutes of white smoke, one minute of red smoke, and one minute of blue smoke. And each of those colors is selectable by its own individual button on the pilot's control column. And the smoke plan is carefully choreographed between Red 1 and Red 6 in winter training to ensure that we have the right smoke, right colour at the right time in the display and that we don't run out. Look to your front now, the synchro pair running back in with red seven in trail on red six. Get your cameras ready. They split. The red smoke comes on for the wonderful, world famous synchro heart. Keep your eye to the high left hand side as red eight comes in and spears the heart.
Give Hannah Formation a massive round of applause for a wonderful horse over the skies of air. Keep your eye now on the synchro pair once again. Red six off to the right, red seven off to the left. They'll dive down to 100 feet. They'll perform a series of opposition barrel rolls only 100 feet above the sea, turning towards each other in a manoeuvre called double roll. Look to your far right hand side in the distance. You can see Enid running back in with eight, a red eight now in trail on red one. The red and the blue come on as they perform a series of barrels through the sky, leaving a snake like trail in the sky in a maneuver called the Python. As I said earlier, there are 10 pilots on the Red Arrows. However, the Red Arrows is not just about the pilots. There are over 140 personnel on the squadron. Over 130 of them are the support personnel. They are the engineers, the administrators, the die team, the public relations, and they are known as the Blues, named due to the colour of their flying coveralls. And a number of the Blues are here today at the public relations tent, so please pop along and say hello. Within those Blues, there are 10 individuals who get to fly in between, in between our displays when we cannot take the full engineering compliment. They are known as Circus. One individual with me at every display is Circus 10. That's Corporal Phil Dye. He's on the beach in front of me filming the display purpose for just debrief and safety purposes. He's also responsible for a lot of the images you see on social media taken from the back of my aircraft. You now have red seven coming in from the left, red six in from the right, once again, over 100 feet and 800 miles per hour closing speed. Each aircraft performs a 360 degree aileron roll. Pull, go, is the call from red six as each aircraft now pull up 5 to 6G, trying to mirror each other. 5 to 6G means everything about them is now weighing 5 to 6 times heavier than what you and I are as we stand on the ground. They reach a height of over 2,500 feet and now 60 degrees inverted on the way down, trying to recapture that 100 feet as they complete the manoeuvre called Boomerang. Look far in the distance now, you can see Enid in the distance, the white smoke comes on and once again Red One pulls them up over 400 miles per hour. They roll to the right, get yourselves ready for the Enid vertical break. As Enid leave directly to the front, the show's still not over. Look to your far right hand side and you've got Hannah running back in. That's red six, seven and eight. With red six, smoking white. With red seven and eight in trail. Red six rolls inverted. And he calls for red seven, eight to roll in the corkscrew. Smoking blue is red seven. Flight Lieutenant Stu Roberts. 
Jim is in his second year in the team. He was Red 2 last year and has flown Typhoon on operational service. Red 8, Smoking Red, is Flight Lieutenant David Simmons, known as Simo. Former Tornado GR4 pilot, where he flew the roll demo in 2010. He also flew the Harrier and the F5 while on exchange with the United States Marine Corps. Look to your right hand side and Enid running back in with the white smoke in trail. Two and three roll go as two and three roll around the outside. Clear go. Clear go as reds four and five rolling out the outside. In one of the hardest manoeuvres for our new pilots each year to master, this is rollbacks. The motto of the Red Arrows is a clat, which means excellence. And that means everyone on the squadron from the very bottom to the very top is striving for excellence in everything that we do. However, we're also aware that we are guardians of that motto for only three to five years. And therefore, we try to leave the squadron in a better place from where we found it. However, look directly to your front. Once again, you've got the red, the nose lights in the distance of Hannah. Seven and eight, roll, go. The blue smoke comes on as red. Seven and eight, roll around six. Once again, get your cameras ready for the HANA Vortex break. Keep your eye on the, the synchro once again. They're up at their perch about a thousand feet. They'll dive down for their final manoeuvre of the show. That 100 feet above the sea. The clone speed of over 800 miles per hour. They'll do a series of bow rolls followed by inverted flight for their final manoeuvre of the show. This is Crossbow. Look directly to your front, Enid running back in with the white smoke in trail. The red comes on from red one as he rolls around the rest of the formation, leaving the infinity symbol in the sky for the infinity break. However, ladies and gentlemen, it's been an honour, it's been a pleasure. Please put your hands together for the 2023 Royal Air Force Aerobatic Team. It's the Red Arrow! Red one puts his smoke on, he'll gather the rest of the formation and take them back to Prestwick Airport. It's not that far to Prestwick, the team will do what's called a magnum break to land. So if you're watching the direction of Prestwick Airport, they'll go into the formation, they'll do a loop and they'll bomb us over the airport if you want to carry on watching that. If you'd like any more information about the Red Arrows, you can look us up online, raf.mod.uk forward slash Red Arrows. We're on Insta and X, which is the new Twitter. We're all on Insta with our own individual profiles. I'm RAF Red 10. If you find me, you'll find the rest of the pilots. Uh, I'll be around the back of the commentary bus for about the next 15 minutes if anyone wants to come say hello. I've also got the Red Arrows prints that have been signed by the pilots. It's £10 cash only please if you want to buy one. However, on behalf of the Royal Air Force and the Red Arrows, thanks very much. Thanks for staying so late in the day. Hope you have a very safe journey back. Please take care. Goodbye. Well, a massive thanks to uh, all of the Red Arrows team and uh, another amazing display. Uh, I have an announcement here for Alan Johnson. Alan Johnson, please go to the first aid post number two. So Alan Johnson, 
you need to make your way to the first aid post number two. And this is a reminder to all personnel, including stall holders, no vehicle movements permitted on site until the area has been made safe. So please, uh, no moving of vehicles onto site until permission from the safety team. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's uh, unfortunately the end of our flying display here. And uh, it's been a fantastic two days. Uh, really big thanks to the uh, Airshow Council because uh, without them, it just would not have been possible. Everybody in the South Airshow Council team have been doing such a good job. Uh, Ashley Buildings, of course, one of our main sponsors, the Royal Air Force Benevolent Fund, Dr. Jeff and all the guys from Skylab. What a great job you did with your uh, STEM uh, area, and that was hugely popular. And of course, everyone from Destination South Air Share. A huge thank you. And uh, Dr. Jeff wants to say a few words first. I do. So, this is also a thank you to you, Joe, for the commentary. That's the world's first AI commentary, too. So, well done, Mayor. Thank you very much. Guys, it was all you made it possible. People of Air, you are amazing. You are the most clappy people that I have ever met at an air show. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, hopefully, I'll be back again next year. And uh, thank the gods for the weather. I think we got out just in time. I think that's a pretty decent shower heading our way. Uh, good luck with your journey back. Uh, my name's been Joe McGrath. And it's been my pleasure uh, being your air show commentator. Hopefully, see you again next year. Have a safe journey home. Goodbye. Everybody. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for sticking with us during that very, very hazy red arrows display. You'll have uh, picked up on the difficulty we were having picking up aircraft. I'm sure, I'm sure you'll realize it wasn't just us. Uh, everyone, uh, Everyone's view obscured by the haze out there. So I've never seen the red arrows display in quite those sorts of conditions, but um, the guys did pretty well despite it, I think. Um, thank you very much for tuning in. Do give the video a like. Make sure to subscribe to us here on YouTube. We'll be live again on Thursday from Jersey. We'll be live from Duxford on the watch.planestv.com service and we'll be uh, contributing to the NATO Days live broadcast next weekend on their YouTube channel as well.
turns to 120 miles per hour. This means that the controls of the, of the aircraft are lost less effective. Hope, ladies and gentlemen, it's been an honour, it's been a pleasure. Please put your hands together for the 2023 Royal Air Force Aerobatic Team. It's the Red Thank you.